Hello and welcome to Weekly Yaiba Kimetsu, the special bonus podcast brought to you by the folks at Weekly Suit Gundam, which is in turn brought to you by the folks at Japan Animation Station. We are here once again to deliver the most weekly podcast on the internet. Last week on the show, I think we had an episode last week, we talked about season three of Kimetsu no Yaiba, the Swordsmith Village arc. And this week, the very next week after the last episode, we are here to talk about the most recent, and depending on what they do with the movies, potentially last season of Kimetsu Yaiba on TV, the Hashira Training Arc Season 4, which finished airing recently. Um, and yeah, it's sort of an intermediary season leading us into the big grand finale, which we now know is going to be a trilogy of movies for Kimetsu Yaiba. Indeed. So it has actually been more than a week. Uh, obviously, oh, Sean is joking. Uh, Swordsmith Village arc was last year. We wanted to do this episode over the summer when the Hashira training arc was airing, but we couldn't because we were doing Kyoto animation stuff. And then we were going to have this last week, but then Sean got sick. Muzan Kibutsuji was doing everything he could to keep us from recording this podcast because he doesn't want to know, want you know the people to know about the Demon Slayers. But we are here to talk about Kimetsu again with its fourth season. And I think kind of a fucking great season. Uh, fuck all y'all haters. Uh, this was good. This isn't filler. You don't know what filler is if you're calling this filler. I really liked this. Yeah, I mean, I liked it. I think it's, you know, it's obviously a much more low-key season by design yeah. and by necessity than the the other seasons, particularly obviously since the end of season one. This has a lot more vibes of that kind of like first half of season one kind of period where it's a little bit slower, a little bit more humor and character focused, and then obviously building up to a really killer last episode. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I like this a lot. Like I don't, you know, like it's, it's an interesting thing because it is designed to be less explosive because it needs to be less explosive because it is setting the board for where we're going to go. But I think for what the season wants to do, which is expand on what is, you know, more or less about one volume plus of um, the manga. That's a pretty kind of thin slice of the manga that leaves a lot of room to, develop some of the other characters, particularly some of the Hashira, um, like um, our Wind Hashira and our Snake Hashira that are going to be important characters going forward. I think there's a lot of really valuable time and space used here in this season. I definitely enjoyed it quite a bit. Yeah, that's my feeling. Like, obviously, if you're going into this expecting the second coming of the Entertainment District arc, you would be disappointed. You would also be a weirdo. Um, that's not what this is. And I think, here's the thing. We are also speaking, and this is something we should say at the outset, from the perspective of people who have read the manga. And yes. UFO Table clearly made this season from the perspective as people who have obviously read the manga. And I think every adaptational choice here is based on things that happen later. And I think if mm -hmm. you have read the manga, I was constantly pointing at the screen and going, that was a smart choice given what is coming later. And I think that is uh, a real theme. And it's been a theme through, obviously, out the, this entire adaptation. The thing that makes this such a special anime is that it takes an already great manga, and I think it basically every turn has improved upon it, and I think expanded upon mm -hmm. what it did on the page. And I think that is just as true this season, because I actually went back and reread this stretch of the manga. Did you do that, Sean? I'm just curious. I didn't reread it through thoroughly. I like, kind of flipped back through it to remind myself of, of like what was in the manga versus like what were things they added for the anime. Yeah. And I, so I reread it and you know, it's a, 
I do think it's a weaker stretch of the manga. I think it's a very vestigial thing where they set up this Hashira training thing. He breezes through it in about one... Ch- the actual Hashira training mm-hmm. portion of the manga is one chapter. And they expand that here a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I will say, though, is, I you know, when I looked through it, this is not that far off from their usual pace of adaptation of the manga. Uh, Kimetsu tends to do about two chapters an episode. Other than episodes three and four here, which are both anime original based on basically two pages apiece from chapter 132, every other episode here does about that two-chapter thing. The premiere and the finale, which are a little bit longer, both do three chapters, and the others do about two apiece. This is not that far off from their usual pace of adaptation, but I think it's making a lot of smart decisions based on, we're going to do the finale of this whole thing as a big-ass movie trilogy, there's a lot of time that we're going to spend with these characters, this is also... Tanjiro's final interaction with a lot of these people in the story Mm -hmm. and so I think there's a lot of important choices here and and one other thing I wanted to say is when we've done past Kimetsu episodes we've been pretty careful not to spoil anything that's coming up in the manga that might be harder today when we're talking about the Hashira training arc and adaptational choices they've made so we'll let you know if we're going to say a spoiler and you can mute the episode for a minute um, but if you are anime only, you might want to keep that in mind if you don't want to be spoiled for anything that happens in Infinity Castle, because I think it's relevant to the conversation today. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it is because very much this is a we need to set all the pieces in place and we want to build and little character moments, because as you know, even if you are anime only, if you see at the end of the season, all the characters get split up when they yeah. end up in the Infinite Castle. And, and we're in like for a very sort of intense finale where all these characters get their own moments as you kind of pointed out we're not going to get as much interaction between some of these groups of characters with each other it's more going to be focused on them in their little cells um as they're fighting through the infinity castle so yeah i think it is really valuable for this season to give us a little bit of extra time especially because they have the space to do it to dig into some of these side characters in explore some of those ideas, set up some of that emotional space. So that way, once we get into that movie trilogy, there's a lot of stuff to pay off because that is what that whole arc is about paying off all these things, big and small set up since the very beginning of the series. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. And, but you know, I also, I just, I really enjoyed this season. I was like kind of blown away at, I think how sharp it is as a piece of characterization, how much I think of a meal it makes out of every individual episode that is going on here. Um, And then it builds to, I think the finale might be the best single episode they've done for TV of Kimetsu no Yaiba. It is like an extraordinary piece of direction and animation. And it is true throughout that, like, if you thought, well, this is just a training arc. Is UFO Table not going to find places to show off? They find places to show off throughout this whole fucking season. Mm -hmm. It's, like, very impressive, I think, how it is mounted. So, you know, I had a lot of fun with this. Is it, again... It, you have to understand that this is not the next like piece of big action, but I have also seen the reaction from the Kimetsu you know haters online who are more in the vein of like who have called the last two arcs filler and are also calling this <laughs> arc filler. And at a certain point, they don't know what any words mean because I guess you could argue this season has stuff that is not in the manga. And if your strict definition is if it's not in the manga, it is by definition filler. Then yes, there's a little bit of filler this season. I think that's a shitty definition of what filler is. Um, I don't think there's any filler here. I think it's doing good things. Like, I think, you know, episode three expands upon the part where um, Tanjiro spends time with Tengen Uzui, the um, sound Hashira. They had a really important relationship in this story for an entire season of TV. And I think spending a little bit more time on... Again, that is their final interaction. In the manga, they never have another interaction. So, like, that makes sense to me to say, let's make an episode out of that. Or him and Muichiro, they also had an entire season together. They never interact again. I don't think it's, like, filler to say that we should spend more time with those characters. Yeah, because it it very much is how you sort of look at that term filler, which means very different things depending on the context you use it in. Because obviously the traditional definition in the anime community has been... We have this, you know, we have Naruto, we have Dragon Ball, we have Bleach, we have One Piece. We have these, like, yearly long shows that put out another episode every single week of an ongoing manga that is not finished. And so there are stretches where they have to do mon- or anime original material in order to build time for the source material to continue. That, to me, is what filler is in the strictest sense in the, yeah. like, anime definition. And that's obviously not what this is, because the manga has been done for years at this point. Like, they're not doing these episodes in order to, like, buy time. They're doing these episodes, I think, because they see an important, like, narrative opportunity 
to execute on here and it allows them to build a nice like what is effectively a core like a little bit less of a core of anime but not that much less because we've got two episodes that are double length and one episode that's a little bit longer so you know in terms of runtime it's not that much smaller than a regular core of anime it's about 11 and a half episodes worth of material or 10 and a half episodes worth of material because ufo table are weird yeah, because they just don't give a fuck, and they're like, whatever, we'll, we'll do two length, double length episodes because we want to do it, um, and it works for the episodes that they do it for, the, the premiere and the finale here. But yeah, so this is not filler in that sense in any way, shape, or form. This is not like, you know, Go Gohan helping the orphans. You know, this is not Bulma getting into wacky adventures in uh, on Namek. This is not Bleach doing a random episode that's like a parody of the fucking 1001 Arabian Nights because they're like, shit, I don't know. We just have to have an episode in here. This isn't, you know, Sasuke and Naruto having the thousandth flashback to his brother killing his village because <laughs> we just have to do that because, goddammit, we caught up to the fucking manga. Um, this is very much them seeing, okay, we, can, we have some space here to flesh out the details. Um, you know, by you know, sort of design, it's not sort of what you'd say critically plot essential material, but it doesn't need to be plot essential material for it to be useful material for the story in fleshing out the characters. And especially for Tanjiro, giving him some like meaningful fe feeling downtime between the end of the Swordsmith Village arc and the absolute fucking madness of where all these characters are going to go. Um, like it didn't bother me so much in the manga that this stretch was very quick because manga pacing is always going to be yes, faster it's than different. anime pacing um but particularly for the anime like i did really enjoy having this downtime and spending a little bit of extra time with these characters especially knowing what's going to come and especially since those are going to be movies there's going to be even less space for them to build in these kinds of little moments that they have occasionally done in the anime of just like little extra time here's a little bit of comedy or here's a little extra kind of thing on the side to build a little bit of more space for the anime pacing um, so yeah, so overall, I really like the approach that they did here. I like, as you point out, it is mostly episodes three and four, where they take the opportunity to expand a lot on these characters that Tanjiro knows and build out that relationship and spend some more time with them. Um, those are mostly original material, taking like a germ of an idea that's in a page of the manga when he like moves on from that training immediately. Um, and then they also take a lot of time to flesh out the sections of the story that involve... Um, Shinazagawa and is it Ibuki is the I always forget the snake guy's name um, oh, Iguro, yeah. that's his name yeah so Shinazagawa the wind Hashira and Iguro the snake Hashira who are like and then obviously you have Himejima who's like the main feature of the end of this um, arc um, but those three Hashira have never really been sort of front and center and particularly Himejima obviously is like really in the background until the end of this arc um, and they kind of more or less straight up just do his the Himejima stuff from the manga because that is by far the most fleshed out of those characters in this section of the story. Um, but I really appreciated them spending more time with Igido, spending more time with Shinazagawa. Like they're like the main characters of the first half of this first episode um, because they are really important characters that we just haven't done a whole lot with yet. Um, and it's good to just sort of get a sense of who they are, get a sense of their relationship, um, get a sense of just kind of like how do they fight and things like that. Um, and it feels like Yufa Table get to kind of play with some different fighting styles, particularly with Igudo, who has his like crazy snake style. Um, and expanding on those two characters is also a really important thing that this season does. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I just, I, I press on the filler issue because it's a frustration beyond just this series. The word in English has effectively been drained of all meaning by idiots on the internet. When you have stuff like episode three of the HBO Last of Us show, which is one of the best <laughs> episodes of television HBO has ever produced, the one with Nick Offerman, um, where they expand on the section on Bill from the video game, and it is by far the best episode of that show. Uh, and there were idiots online saying, but it didn't push forward the story of Joel and Ellie, so it must be filler! Ah! And like... People are dumb, and and uh, I'm mad about people being dumb. And if you dislike Kimetsu for you know good faith reasons, that's fine. But I do think I'm I'm a little sick of the the criticism I see every year with this show is people going, but it hasn't moved the story forward enough. And I'm like, I really at a certain point don't know what you want. You don't want action. Yeah. You don't want character development. You don't want action and character development. I don't know what you want. Yeah, it's, yeah, the filler stuff is annoying, especially when, you know, this will be maybe a conversation we'll have in a future episode of Japanimation Station with the show that we're both watching yeah. that ends with a GT 
That is a show that in the traditional definition doesn't have filler because it's an anime original show. But boy, does it feel like oh, it, has it is a show <laughs> spinning its fucking wheels, hoping, you know, that they could just we just got to get another episode out. So let's like, you know, let's let's spend two and a half minutes on the what happened last week on Dragon Ball GT section, because, man, we have to make these episodes as short as possible. This is not that this is about as far away from like real filler as you can imagine and like that's true of like almost every anime today like any anime fan going around being like oh this show has filler it's like dude they put out fucking eight episodes <laughs> like yeah like the, no filler you don't know filler until you've watched you know your 500 episode long behemoth that put out every new episode every week for years on end um those are the shows that have filler because by production necessity they needed to have it this is so far away from that. And if you're just sort of like throwing it in the filler bucket because it's not sort of, you know, because the Wikipedia summary of it's going to be very short because it doesn't do a lot for the quote unquote main plot line. What you're watching the show for, you don't need to be watching the show for. You can just read the Wikipedia summaries. It's fine. Like if that's what you want is to know what the plot line is, there are, there yeah. are sources for you to enjoy that. If you want to enjoy a TV show, you can watch the TV show and enjoy the atmosphere and the tone and the artistry of the animation and the character development and the story in a more substantive sense than just like how closer did this get them to killing Kibitsuji Muzan. If that's all you want to know, you can just look up what they do at the end of the series online and that's good for you. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I it's a frustration of mine. It's also something that I think anime... I think you can make a very real argument that while it is nice that we don't have to have Gohan meeting orphans on Earth and in space, they do two different yes. Gohan and orphans things in Dragon Ball, while it is nice they don't have to do that, I also think there are some anime that have swung too far the other direction. I think you do mm -hmm. frequently have anime that have to go through manga material too quickly because you only have single cores to do stuff, or at most you have, you know, I think you have seen this in, ver in different anime, it has been a thing that has happened. And one thing I like about Kimetsu is I don't feel like it has ever rushed the story. And I actually think mm -hmm. here in this season, there are some scenes, and I would point to the big Hashira meeting in episode one, where they have the big talk about the, the brands, the marks that appear. And I would point to the first half of the finale, where you have the extremely long scene between Muzan and Ubuyashiki, who is dying, as scenes that I could imagine another anime having to barrel through much faster. And I am glad that Ufo Table took the directorial discretion to say, we're going to slow this down because this scene has to be about atmosphere. It has to be about pauses. You know, this is something I've been thinking about lately about like, what is the optimal length for, you know, adapting manga to anime? And it just, it differs based on show to show. I've been watching through the, this year's episodes of One Piece where they started the Egghead Island arc. And I would argue that over the course of Wano now into Egghead, I think One Piece has come pretty close to finding the optimal pacing for adapting Eiichiro Oda's very compressed, fast moving manga into a moving image medium. And it's been something I'm actually very happy to see. And One Piece to be clear, has not always had an optimal pace uh -huh. of that of that manga. I think they've kind of cracked the code here in the, you know, 1100 range of episodes. Um, and it was something I thought about watching these two, if there's somewhere I'm happy that scenes don't breeze by because you got to fill X number of pages for this episode. Um, you know, UFO Table can do whatever they want at this point. They made the highest grossing movie in Japanese history. This is the most popular anime on television. They're good. And I, I think you can feel that discretion at work in the material itself. Absolutely. Yeah, that it's it's they know the juicy scenes you really want to spend a lot of time on and be like kind of the centerpieces of episodes. And sometimes in the season, you're looking at a sequence that is like a couple of pages, like um, the training with Iguro, where he ties up all the different core members to the like planks yes. or whatever. And Tanjiro has to figure out how to fight him while avoiding them. That's in the manga. But it's like two or three pages of that. Yeah. chapter like it's a very brief little sequence and it's a big fleshed out actual training sequence here that both gives you more time to kind of like explore a little bit of Igudo's character and obviously it's all tied to his like relationship with Kanroji and this kind of jealousy he feels but it also has a lot to do with his style of fighting and what Tanjiro needs to learn in order to advance to the next stage 
Um, and that second part of the equation is a very minor part of the sequence in the manga, and it feels like a really huge emphasis here. And I just feel like they find spots for that everywhere, whether they're adapting pages from the manga or they're inserting wholly original material like making airplanes with Michiro and stuff like that. Um, yes. it's, it's, it's very well done. One other thing that I think is very pleasing about this season is it has one of the most stacked voice casts of any anime yes. core in recent memory because you have the whole, you know, main, you know, group of Kimetsu characters. So, you know, you have, we didn't have Inosuke or Zenitsu, Zen, uh, Zenitsu really last season. We have them back, you know, so we have all of that. Um, so we have the main characters, but also this is the most time we've spent with the Hashira altogether. And as we talked about way back on the season one episode of Kimetsu, UFO table, you know, they hit up their 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 contact book and got all the most famous voice actors they know to play the Hashira. They are a really stacked at cast of actors, and they are all here, other than, you know, I guess um, the, the, the flame Hashira is not, because he's yeah, dead. Yeah, Rengoku. Yeah, Rengoku is not, but the rest of them are here, and so you have just a ton of amazing actors here. I, I think particularly Tomokazu Sugita walks away with this season. He is... Yes phenomenal it is some of the best work he's ever done it is the deepest his voice has ever gotten um huh. it's amazing he is so good here and he is to be clear he's himajima he's the the stone hashira um but everybody gets gets time to shine and there's just so many good actors in that cast and it's cool to see them all together because in the past having all these actors together would be like one scene in season one and a brief scene at the end of season two when you know you have um the first of the upper rank demons go down and they all react to it or something like that but this is like a full season where they are in every episode and that's really cool yes yeah it is you you just get the full st stacked cast including like some you know little kind of vocal cameos from characters we haven't seen in a long time like uh sabito you know, gets yes. his little cameo in Gyu's flashback. And so we get Kajiyuki comes back for that role. Um, yeah, it is definitely like a who's who of big voice actors and a lot of them getting really, really good material. Like yeah. the biggest ones being for me, Morikawa, who plays Ubiyashiki, um, and then Toshiko Seki, who plays Kibutsuji Muzan in that yes. last episode. They just get such juicy material. But yeah, everybody. So you've got like Suzumura Kenichi plays Iguro, who is the snake Hashira. Um, and, you know, he finally kind of gets a lot of good material that we haven't, I don't think we've even really seen that character outside of a brief cameo since the end of season one. Um, we get Shinazagawa, uh, Sanami, I guess that character's first name. Um, I never actually knew what his uh, given name was, so I'm looking it up now. Um, but that's Tomikaze Seki, of course. Um, you know, Domon Kashu himself all the way back from Mobile Fighter G Gundam and obviously one of the big voice actors and everything. Um, we had him recently as Izak in the Mobile Suit Gundam Seed Freedom. He yes. gets a nice little piece in that movie as well. Um, but he has some really great scenes, and obviously there's a lot of great drama that they're setting up between him and his younger brother, Ginya, um, who we got a lot in the last season. Um, and that's some of the material I'm most excited to see them adapt when they get to yes. Infinity Arc is the conclusion of um, that relationship. But that stuff that, again, is all in the manga in this section, but they really expand on, um, I feel like you get a lot of really great material from... Um, that character as well. And then, as you said, for me, the the big performance here is Sugita Tomikazu as Himeji Megiyome, our stone Hashira, who is like that dude that if you had read the manga, you know is incredibly fucking cool because we haven't even gotten to the cool shit he does yet. No. So that's going to be in the movies. Um, but like if you've read the manga, you know this guy is absolutely incredible and such a great character. But he is the one, the one Hashira who has been by far the most in the background up to this point. Like, he gets, like, a little tiny bit at the end of season one. But compared to the other characters, like, Igudo and Shina, Shinazugawa have some more direct interaction with Tanjiro in the scene where Tanjiro is brought in front of all the Hashira. Um, whereas Himejima doesn't do a whole lot. And he mostly so stands kind of, there with his prayer beads and goes, Nabu Abida Butsu. And he says that over yeah. and over again. That's most of Sugita's dialogue before this season. Yeah, so it's like, it's it's a character that you know everybody in the anime-only community has been sleeping on the entire time because he just hasn't been featured. And then his stuff in the last couple episodes is so good, um, both in terms of them getting his big flashback, but then also they expand on some of his action stuff he does when Muzan shows up. Um, and it just, it's, I love that character. And I, and... You know, ever since season one, I've known that, man, that is perfect casting, having Sugita play this guy. Um, but you, it's nice to see that casting finally get paid off all the way now, years later in season four. Well, it's fun for us because since we last 
talked about <laughs> yes. Himetsu with Swordsmith Village, we did a whole season of Kyoto Animation where we heard Tomokazu Sugita a lot. Most famously as, you know, Kyon in Haruhi, but he pops up through all their stuff in, in little yes. places. So we've, we've I mean, we already loved Tomokazu Sugita. I have a deeper love of him now after watching all of the Kyoani stuff and hearing him here. Um, because because really, I mean, Himejima is the character who this season turns on. Because I would say what this mm-hmm. season is ultimately about is that there is a small core of characters, basically Ubuyashiki and Himejima, who understand the depths of sacrifice that are going to be necessary to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And everyone else is a little, they know that this is going to be hard. They don't quite get it to the degree those characters get it. And then the world literally falls out from under their feet. As, as it starts, right? And that throws us into the Infinity Castle arc. But, you know, Gyome is the one who Ubiyashiki trusts with, I'm going to die, you're going to let me die, and we're going to try to take this guy down. And I think the the gradual unveiling of, of Tanjiro going through the layers of the Hashira training and kind of peeling back the onion that is this grouping, this, this organization of the Hashira and of the upper ranks of the Demon Slayers until he gets to Gyome and as experienced as Tanjiro thinks he is with these people, this guy is just on a different level and he has been through shit that most of them have not quite been through and so he is the one who has, you know, Ubuyashiki's right hand and is ready to go to town on this thing and the way that finale plays of the utter calm and confidence that both Muzan and Ubuyashiki have in their confrontation combined with Gyome coming out to do his part and then everyone else, you know, just trying to get there in time and the franticness and the readiness to fight and then it all is so much worse than they thought and then Ufo Table drops the mic and says, come back for the movies. It's I think it's like structured really, really well. Absolutely. Because I think one of the things that um, Himejima does as a character is he contrasts with the Hashira in such a nice way that it makes you conscious of the fact that most of the Hashira are very young still. Yes. Um, I think Tengen is a little bit older, but all the other ones, they're all they're effectively like teens. Um, you know, there's there's a whole plot point that I don't think they explain all they don't explain all the stuff with the mark in the season yet, right? They kind of like leave. They some explain of that. everything other than the idea that you will die at twenty five, which is an idea okay. in the manga that comes up in Infinity Castle. Sorry, yeah, spoiler, yeah. but there's, spoiler. there's a big moment where they ominously go, if you manifest the mark, and then it cuts away and everyone goes, yeah. oh, and the thing they have cut is a, a detail about what the mark will do to your life, yes. Yeah, I, I didn't remember if they had actually said exactly what it is yet, but yes, yeah, so so all of them are below 25 years old, and the thing with Gyome is that he is older than that, right? So yeah. there's like a little moment where he's like, well, what will happen to me? <laughs> you know, it's like if I manifest the arc mark because, you know, he's an old man. Um, And he is a sort of parental figure. Um, And I think it's that thing where up till now we have seen the Hashira as being the sort of like the pinnacle. Um, And, you know, they are these, as as the name means in Japanese, it's the thing that I've always kind of had mixed feelings of them just not translating this term. Hashira means pillar. So they are the pillars of the Demon Slayer core. Um, And so they, that, and that's very much what they represent. They are these like pillars that hold up the organization and they are these things that all the other members of the core aspire to be. Um, but even within that framework, Himejima stands above the rest, not only because he's the most powerful, but also because he is the oldest, he is the wisest, he is the most experienced. And so he is then also the one who Ubiyashiki trusts with this knowledge, because not only is he older than all the Hashira, he's older than Ubiyashiki himself. Um, he's the only he's, one who never spent his life training for this. He came exactly. to it much later. He spent his life doing something very different, and that's a big surprise to Tanjiro and the audience because Tanjiro is in, involved with all these people who it's all they've ever known, and it's true of Tanjiro yeah. too. Um, at least in like their you know young adult adult living memory, um, and and that is not who Himajima is. Yeah, and I just think it like makes this really potent contrast that sets up so much about the themes about, um, you know, about life, about death, about like, you know, what you pass on and what you leave behind you and legacy um, and all those things that are the essential core themes of Demon Slayer that will continue to be the essential core themes into the final arc. um, But that, and have been the essential core themes up till now, but this season starts really zooming in and on and setting up all those ideas in a very potent way because it is where everything ultimately needs to land is on this essential contrast between the demons that live forever, um, but are these sort of cowardly, hollow, pathetic 
creatures um, and these humans that live very short, you know, dramatic and sometimes very tragic and violent lives, but aspire to something better and can leave something better behind them. Um, and that is that contrast. And that is what like Gyome as this adult character kind of shows that path forward. This man who has lived a life with a, like sort of deep regret of this failure he has and has committed his adult life to passing this forward and kind of looking on at these children because he calls all the members of the Demon Slayer Corps children is what he refers to them as. Um, and that serves as this with him and Ubiashki, this contrast with Muzan as these kind of parental figures and Muzan being this obviously horrific idea of a parental figure, but that is what he is to the demons. He is the person who has created them. And then Ubiashki and Himejima are the parental figures for the Demon Slayer core. And that contrast is very vital. Yes. And of course, the ending of this season is about how you can only prepare your children for so much <laughs> because yes. the world might literally fall out from under your feet. Um, yeah, I am, I am similarly like you, Sean, mixed on the translation of Hashira. Just so people know, like Sean said, it means pillar and like it's it's not just like a random word that was chosen like i feel like it's a word that was meant to be translated i feel like if you mm -hmm. asked gotoge sensei is this a word you think the english author you know readership should know the etymology of i think he would pro that he or she we don't know their gender would probably say yes and uh yeah so i'm mixed on that too in my dissertation when i used the word hashira I initially planned to translate it as pillar. In the final draft, I used it so few times, I thought it would be more confusing than just leaving it as Hashira for people searching it. But I think if you were doing any kind of like in-depth writing about this, you would have to translate it. It's it's too, it's kind of like when they didn't translate Mugen for Mugen Train, which yes, yes, before I get the fucking comment, I know there was an American animated show called Infinity Train, which has been erased by the internet, from the internet by David Zaslav. So it's not a problem anymore. Um, but anyway, some show no one's ever heard of, Infinity Train, blah, blah, blah. But like, it is important that the word Mugan means infinity. It's why they are not calling the next arc Mugen Castle, because it is important yes. that the word infinity is there in the name. No, they should really just call the next arc uh, Demon Slayer, the Mugenjo uh, <laughs> anime trilogy, um, yeah. and just make everyone be like, what the fuck is this? What's Mugenjo? Is yeah. that, is, they, is, a, is a guy, is his name Joe? Is he Mugen? Yeah. <laughs> For Hashira, it is a tough call because there's always the argument of do you translate proper nouns? Does Hashira count as a proper noun? Is it a title? What is it? But they are pillars, and I, and I agree with you, Sean, that I think it is important to like have that etymology in mind talking about them. Yeah, because it's a very particular term. Like, it's not a thing you would... It's it's not like a common ranking or whatever in Japanese society is like, right. oh, yeah, I, you know, I, I went up the corporate ladder and now I'm the Hashira of <laughs> this paper company, you know, like that's just not a thing. So it's it's chosen symbolically, I think, very importantly. So it, how it, cool it, would that I, be, though, if they just if, if some Japanese like Nintendo decided our CEO is no longer the chief executive officer. They are the <laughs> Hashira of Nintendo. <laughs> yes, I am the gaming Hashira. Okay, Miyamoto could. I think you could give Miyamoto that that yes. title. That would make sense. They should do that. Yes. All right. Um, anyway, we're getting off topic. How do you want to break down this season? You want to start at the beginning? We've only got eight episodes to go through. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an easy way to kind of walk through this thing. So we'd start with our first uh, double length episode because again, Yufa Table. They're you know they're old hands at this at this point. They've been doing it for like <laughs> ten years or something now of just yes. saying yeah, fuck it, let's just do a double length episode once our thing is popular enough. Um, and this is where we get a big long sequence at the beginning of the first episode that's all original material with Igudo and Shinazagawa out on a mission, um, which feels like a little bit overkill, you know, sitting two Hashida, based on what we've seen of Hashida, <laughs> like sitting two Hashida to go deal with like some regular demons. Um, if you're not sure that there's some like upper rank motherfucker out there, I don't know why you need to send both of them. Um, but obviously you just want to have like some cool stuff with these two characters we haven't seen a lot about. And I like this sequence where they set up the Infinity Castle. Yes. Um, and they're they're chasing this demon and they're seemingly about to get him. And then the castle appears out of nowhere. The demon falls away into it and then it closes and they're just like, what the flying fuck? Like, I like that reaction of from them where they've obviously seen some weird shit that the demons have done. But what this Infinity Castle thing is, is on a scale that's so far outside what they've ever encountered before that they're completely baffled by what the fuck has just occurred. I think it's actually important for the audience because we've been to Infinity Castle a couple times in the anime now, 
but the characters don't know about it. Like that is yes. the audience has intimate knowledge of this thing, but that is only the audience. And I think it is important to remind the audience going into this season that our main characters do not know that Muzan has this other dimension. That is a power that is unknown to the heroes. Um, yeah, I mean that moment, Sean. So for people who, who don't remember, this aired in theaters. There was the to the Hashira training. Yes. <laughs> which I love for Swordsmith Village it made sense they called that one to the Swordsmith Village great they're going to the Swordsmith Village the fourth season one they called to the Hashira training which I thought was kind of funny uh, because I guess he's going to the Hashira training but it's not really a place it's an idea anyway it, it, it kind of it makes it sound like he's you know going to put on his sort of like workout shorts uh, and yeah. a sweatshirt and get on the bus to go to the gym <laughs> is uh, yes. I'm on the way to my to the Hashira training you know we're going to yeah. do a mile on um, you know, a treadmill, then we're going to do some squats and, you know, we're going to like work on our legs today. Uh, it's the Hashira training, you know, it's a new method. I bought the DVDs for it. Yeah. So they, you know, they did this for Swordsmith Village where they played the end of season two and then the beginning of season three in theaters. And then they did it for this, where they played the final, the final episode of season three, which was an hour long episode. And then the first episode of season four, which is also an hour. So it was about a, you know, two hour, 90 minute kind of thing. Um, interestingly, I was actually looking up the box office for this when I was writing my dissertation. Swordsmith Village was very big and then Hashira Training was still big but did quite a bit less in Japan at the box office. It did way more in America. Like it was much bigger than the Swordsmith Village one because it was released as a full theatrical like wide release for multiple weeks mm. and it made a lot of money. It was number two at the box office in its opening which is crazy when you consider that we've never basically had these kind of compilation films in America. But anyway, I'm getting off topic. My point is... You know, I got to see this in theaters. It was actually an influential experience for me because it was seeing the end of season three, uh, which has the big episode in Infinity Castle uh, or the big scene there. Um, or no, that's the premiere of season three. It has another thing, but yeah. there's other stuff going on there. It gave me some ideas for my dissertation, seeing it on the big screen. But then the season four premiere, that opening scene plays so well in a movie theater and that it is such a good shot where they're coming up and over the castle the castle in the real world and they're chasing the demon and it's this fluid 3d camera shot that follows the hashira up and over and just seamlessly the world has transformed into the infinite castle and that is yeah. below them and they are falling and then it shuts that was an incredible movie theater shot and i just feel like the one of the main reasons they've been putting these episodes in theaters is to just tell us why they want to do infinity castle as a series of movies because uh -huh. holy crap is that going to look incredible um but yeah i think that's a just a, a great scene and there's also adaptationally something they're doing here that is a change from the manga but i think a very smart thing when you're doing this as a season of tv in the manga they say pretty clearly that there have been no demon sightings since Nezuko has has walked in the sun, that the demons mm -hmm. have just disappeared, and so no one has any work to do. Well, obviously that doesn't fit with this scene where we have the Hashira out hunting demons. They alter that line that Tanjiro says at one point to, there have been fewer demon sightings. And then throughout this season, we get a couple of moments where we see demons and we see some people having to go out and patrol and stuff. And they add this whole plot arc where the um, the Biwa lady from the Infinity Castle, one of Muzan's main, she gets elevated to a upper rank in the next arc. Yeah, but she's anyway. four. Yeah, she's four. But anyway, she is looking. Why we have these little demon sightings is because she is finding where all the demon slayers are. And she is getting ready to drop everyone into the infinite castle, which is the end of this season. And I think that is such a smart thing that they seed throughout these eight episodes. Because you also in the manga don't see anyone except the Hashira and Tanjiro fall in. You don't see like where is Zenitsu when he falls in? Where is Genya? They add all of that and they add this thing of like while everyone's been doing the Hashira training... You have had Muzan and the Biwa lady going around and basically finding where all the demon slayers are so they can hatch their plot to just kill all of them. And I think that's such a smart little thing they seed through this season that is technically a change from the manga, but I think a very smart one for a TV show. Yeah, well, it, it helps create that structure of the season where even in the first half of the Hasha training stuff, which is very peaceful, right? It's, it's yeah. I mean, peaceful, relatively speaking, in terms of it's all sort of inner drama within the Hashira training core, but it's mostly Tandra going around and meeting all his old friends and going, Hey guys. And him being yeah. very cool and powerful and kind of showing off how much Tandra has grown as a character and how he's like fucking Sylvester Stallone ripped at this point, which I do <laughs> love how fucking yes. just beef beefy Tandra is now feels really like nice. You see his development. He used to be the scrawny little kid. Now he's just like fucking, you know, he's got like, you know, half percent body fat. He's just an absolute monster at this point. 
Um, and so you've got the more peaceful stuff of Tanjiro having fun and hanging out with his old buddies, but you always have these little moments in each episode where you are setting up that the demons are plotting something, and you see more of that from Muzan's um, perspective with Biwa and the little, like, eyes that she's sending out to track people and the demon slayers that are wandering the streets on patrol and are sort of you know, being very wary and then slowly kind of letting their guard down a little bit. And so you do get the structure of the season, which is that both sides are setting up their strategy for what this final confrontation is going to be. And the audience is slowly kind of piecing together what that is, because you've got obviously the Hashira training stuff to bring up the overall level of the entire core, which that idea is going to be very important, is very important that like it's not just the the really powerful people that are good it's that everybody is going to be necessary for this fight if they're going to succeed um and so you've got that going on but you also obviously have a lot of like the specific traps that ubiashki is setting up to go off in the last episode but you also have muzan who is setting his plan into place and it is a lot more elaborate than you maybe initially realize until that reveal at the very very end of the season that everybody is getting dropped into the infinite castle and that muzan has you know been he's been bested in some ways but he has the sort of final trump card that he's been setting up the entire season and yeah i think that is a great reveal of of paying off this little thing of these eyes tracking all these people throughout the whole season and that like putting it together in the last moment like ah that's what they've been doing they've been setting up this grand trap to get all of the demon slayer core and so muzan can wipe them all out in one fell swoop um it's a great great payoff to a very deliberately set up reveal that as you say there are seeds of it in the manga but structurally it's not done like this and they expand on that idea pretty substantially yeah absolutely um other scenes in this first episode obviously we get everything with tanjiro as basically every season of demon slayer has yes. begun um you know convalescing in bed after his horrific injuries from the previous season and i think we get another you know handful of very funny scenes here we get another appearance obviously of what's the name of his sword maker um who's a total oh. weirdo but i um I, yeah hagenes Gassan. Hagenes Gassan, yeah, who in this case is too beat up and hurt from the events of the previous season to be angry at Tanjiro anymore, which is very funny. You get um, Inosuke just bursting through the window and breaking it to announce himself this season, which is a great introduction to Inosuke. You get the joke that Genya has been in the room the whole time trying to sleep <laughs> while they're having crazy adventures. Um, you get the great joke when Zenitsu comes back that Inosuke spent weeks teaching uh, Nezuko <laughs> to say only his name. So so that when she sees Zenitsu, she says, hello, Inosuke, uh, which is a great joke from the manga done very, very well in the anime. So that's all very fun. And, and that's just kind of our fun part of the episode. Yeah, and I do enjoy that. And again, I, I, one thing I like with the Tanjiro part of it is each time he comes back more fucked up than the previous one, yep. but he gets better faster. And you yes. just get that sense of, of his progression as a, you know, your main character, him getting more powerful as you go through. That just gives you some of that sort of essential Shonen Jump action series kind of thing you want to see your main dude just get better and better and, and getting closer and closer to reaching that kind of Hashira level that you know he, he's kind of striving for um and i like that you know some of the comment the characters are starting to comment on it at this point they're just like man you're you're just like them like you're just a little monster dude like what the fuck you had every bone in your body was broken and you got better in like three days because you breathe better or whatever like what the fuck yeah, and, and you know, this is a complaint that I at least can somewhat sympathize with as I've seen the complaint about the kind of structural repetition of that. But I guess my pushback would be, A, it's every shown in anime. Um, I just think Kimetsu is a little more upfront about it. Like, Kimetsu doesn't have senzu beans or something like that uh -huh. to, like... Because this also happens to Goku all the time in Dragon Ball, and he gets faster and faster at his, like, you know, regeneration or whatever. It's just they don't have Dragon Balls and, and senzu beans and all of that stuff. But I also think, like, there's something nice about how the show is upfront about it. It uses it as a way to kind of show his progression. And it's a very short manga and series, and this is the last time we see it. So, like, it's... Mm -hmm. it's they don't do it... 10 times they do it three or four um and i think it's a fun version of it especially when you have you know in the delightful character like inosuke just rushing through and you know in in the last season he was hiding on the ceiling this time he breaks through a window and and is forced to then repair it it's great yeah and i you know i think it's 
in these kinds of stories that are very arc based and very episodic, it's nice to have structure. It's nice to have a yeah. status quo that you return to because you don't in Demon Slayer, you do not spend much time in the status quo. No. Um, it is it is like, you know, you get these very brief little moments of respite until you go off into the next arc. And then it's just madness and giant crazy fights and all that stuff happening and, you know, big elaborate flashbacks with the demons and all the stuff that they do in the sort of central storylines. And so I really enjoy, and this is true of all these kinds of shows, I really, really enjoy the moments where, oh, we get back to the village and we kind of, things go back to some kind of normal before everything gets absolutely fucked up again. And then that's when the moments where the series progresses to a point where, well, there is no going back to normal, very impactful, like in Naruto when the village hidden in the leaves gets destroyed by pain, or obviously at the end here. Wait, what? Spoil Naruto for me. Oh, no. I mean, you know, there's still like 200 episodes of Naruto after that happens. So, you know, there's still a lot. Um, but Yeah, but how much you know, of that is filler, Sean? Not as much as you'd think. Okay. Um, there's a lot There's a lot that happens. Uh, there's a lot yeah. that happens after the village the, and the leaves gets destroyed. And here, obviously, at the end of the season is when there's no going back to normal. The fucking manor blows up. Everyone gets thrown to the Infinity Castle. You don't need to have read the manga to know we're not coming back to these moments again. Yeah. Um, and so I really like the structure. I really like the little, like, hey, we're back. We're, he, we're seeing all of our buddies. We're getting our little, like, dumb comedy bits. We're, you know, marveling at the fact that Tanjiro is somehow still alive. And he's even more ripped. And his body is just covered in horrific scars at this point, which I also like. Like, you see the damage on him in that, like, th- all of this shit has taken a really profound toll on him as a person. Like, both emotionally, mentally, and physically. But he's still pushing past that and is still the optimistic, compassionate person that is the core of Tanjiro's character. All that stuff, I think you need the routine to highlight those things. Um, yeah. And so I understand why some people maybe don't like that stuff. For me, I think it's a really important part of any series like this to have those elements. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Two other big scenes in the premiere, there is the Hashira meeting. And I think this is a really interesting scene because this is where we start to get to see the how the Hashira see the world without Tanjiro in the room, because he's usually mm-hmm. in the room with us. And part of that is that we start to see here, and of course this is a setup for the finale, just how deeply these people respect Ubuyashiki. Like the mm-hmm. moment when his it's his wife, Amane, comes out to lead the meeting, and they realize he he can't see them anymore. And um, Gyome leads them in this like deep bow of like reverence. And you also see just how like to each of them, it's like they're losing their dad because he is a father yeah. figure to each of them. And that's one of those things that when I say this scene, I like that it is, it's like a 20 minute scene. It's a really yeah. long stretch of the episode. Like it goes through, I think multiple act, at least one eye catch break. Um, but it's a, it's a very big stretch of the episode. But I think it's important to understand that like, these people can also feel fear and sadness and terror and all these things and like and realize that they are on the brink of something big and then also if you know where everything is going with the mark the moment that is excised for us where they learn that the mark is going to exact a certain price and then we come back and realize not a one of them is hesitating on that you know it's a it's a really good scene that i think was a scene i remember waiting for the anime to get to because it's one of the best scenes of all the hashira together and it's done beautifully here yeah, and there's just a lot of really great little character moments. Obviously, this is where you get some of Giyu's stuff set up, where he does the classic Giyu thing of um, he thinks he's saying one thing and everybody takes it the other way, where he gets up and he's like, I'm not like the rest of you. Um, and they all interpret that as he thinks he's hot shit, whereas what <laughs> he is really saying is something very sad, which is that he doesn't really consider himself as being properly the water Hashira. He kind of thinks he's a bench warmer until Tanjiro is going to get up to that level and replace him, um, which is all stuff we will get in his episode. And obviously that's all stuff from the manga as well, but you get that scene here. Um, and I, I really like those little moments they set up there with Shinazagawa and how he interprets those. But then you get Himeshima's big moment of where he claps his hands together and says silence. And that's where you get, I think, the first full realization of his position in the pecking order, that he is the guy who is the one notched down from Ubiyashiki. And that now that Ubiyashiki is out of action, he's basically the dude calling the shots. Um, and I think that sets up well what they need to do with that character at the end of the season. Yes, I completely agree. Um, but yeah, really, really good scene. 
The other big sequence here is at the end where you have Tamayo, who is the demon character who, if you're only watching the anime, we haven't seen in a while. But she yeah. is the one who is helping Tanjiro develop a cure for Nezuko, basically. And so he's been sending the blood of the upper rank demons to her. Um, and she is visited by the crow belonging to Kaguya Ubuyashiki and invited to come work with Shinobu at the, at the headquarters. And this will all pay off later in the Infinity Castle arc. I mainly want to highlight this scene because I came out of the uh-huh. movie theater going, who voiced the crow? The uh-huh. crow crow in that scene is such a good voice and i figured it out later it, it was not available in like the immediate aftermath of the theatrical uh-huh. premiere because i don't know if they even credit these characters on screen but it is show hayami who is a great character actor he's probably best known as sosuke the villain in bleach um although for ufo tables purposes he is uh tokiomi tosaka in yes. fate zero which is a very memorable character um and, I, and then i think you see him a little bit in other ones because he's the father of reen um but oh my god i just the idea that they're like who voices the crow? Let's get show high on me. Oh, it's so good. I love when Ufo Table just flexes like that. <laughs> yeah, I love it so much too because you see all these other crows all the time and they're all, you know, doing the like, ah, I'm a crow. Yes. And they're doing that kind of voice. <laughs> and then you get this just the most badass looking crow you've ever seen. He's got like a little scarf um, and these incredibly disturbing, fucked up looking eyes. And then, and then yeah, Jaime Show's voice comes out of it and it's just... You know, I can only imagine seeing it in a movie theater with that kind of sound set up and oh, like your be, whole scene worked out the fucking yeah. <laughs> yeah, with the bass, like he's just got, you know, the deepest fucking voice in the world. Uh it's so amazing. And yeah, it is just this crow. Um and it, you know, this is a scene that's in the manga, but they definitely like expand on it more here and really sort of like ring out the tension here to really sort of make you feel how momentous this thing is of the Demon Slayer core willingly reaching out to a demon like Tamiyo. Um, that's not like necessarily the same thing as Nezuko, and Nezuko is already an extreme exception, but Tami is a demon who's been alive for hundreds of years who has killed and eaten plenty of people in her past. Obviously, she's like a reformed demon who's trying to fight against Muzan, but even still, this is an extreme measure, and Tamiyo obviously is also very hesitant about working with a whole legion of people whose entire life and specialty is just murdering demons like her. Um, And it's that thing where I think it's a great moment to end the first episode on where it feels like, oh, this is a line being crossed that leads us to the climax. This is like a point of no return that once we are like the Demon Slayer Corps and Tamiyo are starting to work together, that is like we are in the final stages of this shit. Um, and, and so having Ubiyashiki's personal crow going out and being the coolest crow in the history of crows, um, and having this incredibly intimidating presence where it feels like that crow could fucking kill her. Like he's yeah. so, <laughs> he's so intense. Like, I want to see that crow fucking take on and keep it Suji Muzan and just like deal with that for situation for a little bit because he's probably pretty cool. Um, it's, it's a really great moment to end the episode on that. They just milk so much drama and just tone and mood out of that moment. It's a smart little piece of adaptation, too, because it's in a later chapter in the manga. Mm -hmm. It comes after all the stuff with Giyu uh, and Tanjiro and after the Hashira training is underway, but they move it up to the premiere, and it's it's such a great ending. I remember, I mean, that's where you would cut to credits in the movie screening version of this, where the movie version also ended, if you haven't heard it, with a killer remix of the season three theme mixed with the score from the show by Go Shina that is really cool. You can find it on, uh, I don't think it's on Apple, like it's not streaming, but you can buy it on Apple Music or uh, iTunes is how I had to get it, but it's very good. You can probably find it on YouTube. But anyway, so it was a very cool ending. I am also, though, Sean, I'm now looking at the list of voice actors who have done the crows. They've done this for all of them, and I didn't even know it. I didn't realize Rie Kugemiya is mm-hmm. Muichiro's crow. Yui yes. Horie is Mitsuru Kanroji's crow. Kenyu Horiyuchi is Sanami's crow. It's crazy. They've got a Ryusei Nakao. Fucking Frieza was Genya's crow. That's fr- yeah. just crazy. <laughs> yeah, they have always cast really, really big voice actors as the crows, but in general, most of them are doing crazy crow voices, so you can't yes. really tell. The only one that I think you can really hear is Kukumi or VA as Ginko, the the yeah. uh, that the crow from Uichiro, because that's a little bit more of a normal voice, and you got plenty of that character also in season three, so I kind of remembered that one. But I love that they're they're clearly not directing Hayami show. They're not being like, oh, and do kind of a crow thing. They're like. 
do the deepest, most intimidating voice you can possibly do. And, you know, you can just yeah. picture him in the booth, like, cracking his neck and being like, sure, you got it. <laughs> and then do it a crow the sound system. And then it's like they're like their mics aren't even picking it up. It's like you're going lower than like the rest that we can. Can you bring it up just like a notch so that the mics can actually even record it? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great moment. Episode two is the one about Giyu, uh, the water Hashira, and is is maybe the best episode of the season beyond like the stuff at the end with um, the stone Hashira and, and the finale. And I think it's such a good, this is one that is, it's fairly faithful to what's in the manga, but it is also a chapter that's somewhat short and they flesh it out a bit. And I think it's just, it's very good because Giyu is also a character who we've technically seen him a lot, but we know so little about him at this point still. And I think realizing that he's got this really big chip on his shoulder. Um, and I think there's that, but then I think also just, and this is the storytelling in the manga too, of centering it on Tanjiro, who is a very empathetic character. And this person presents a real challenge because Tanjiro can usually get through to people and he can't get through to this guy who saved his life, who is so important to him, right? Who is the, I mean, he's in chapter one as the person who spares Nezuko uh, and saves Tanjiro and brings him to Ubiyashiki, or not Ubiyashiki, what's the name of the trainer uh, at the beginning? Uh, yeah, Ur Urukadaki-san. So you have all of that, um, and, but he can't find the words. And I think the arc of this episode being Tanjiro figuring out what are the words to give this guy. And it is effectively, even though he doesn't know it, the same kind of thing that Sabito told him in the past of like, you can't give up the gift of, of life, what Sabito gave his life for. And then of course, tying it into Sabito's story, which is the earliest like big thing that happens in Demon Slayer is, is Tanjiro breaking that boulder and working with Sabito and all of that stuff. Um, I think it's such a cool like way to tie it all together. And, and I love this episode. This episode also expands on what is a one panel joke in the manga, which is them doing their soba eating contest. And I do love that they give it a full scene here because it is such a great idea of Tanjiro thinking he hasn't found the words, even though he has, and deciding to go in a completely different direction and challenge him to a soba eating contest. It's fucking great. Yeah, well, because, you know, because that's like part of the running joke with Gyu that I think you almost kind of know better if you read the manga because it's a thing that happens a lot in like the little kind of interstitial like four coma things that occasionally, yes. you know, all these manga will throw in there. That the joke is that he's this very clumsy, awkward person who just is not able to express the things that he feels appropriately to people, right? And that's part of this whole thing. As I mentioned with episode one where he tells all the Hashira um, I'm not like you and they all interpret it one way but what he really means is that he is not at their level like he doesn't deserve to be one of them um, and he just can't communicate that and that's also the central thing with like Tanjiro doesn't realize that he has completely changed this guy's entire life <laughs> yes. in that moment like that's how bad he is at expressing things is his whole worldview has been upended by this little dude uh, and still he's not able to really express it in a way that Tanjiro can understand so then they have to go to the Soba contest um, but yeah, I think this is just a phenomenal episode. I've always really loved Gyu's character. And I think that there's something here about Tanjiro realizing that he doesn't know anything about this guy, right? The Tomioka Gyu is outside of Rengoku, the most important Hashira to him. Like this guy who is the beginning of everything for Tanjiro's life, um, as a demon slayer. And he so looks up to him because obviously the other big thing is that Gyu comes in at the end of the first big fight with a powerful demon he has with Rui, the spider demon. And he's the guy who comes in, does the whole like Nagi move and kills Rui when it seems like everything is lost. So it's like this is this guy who I think Tanjiro looks up to so profoundly, but then he realizes he knows absolutely nothing about him. Um, and then realizing that they are really actually closely connected because both through Urakodaki, but then also through Sabito very specifically. Um, and, and I think that's just a really nice moment of growth for both Gyu and Tanjiro, for Tanjiro to start to get to be on the Hashira level a little bit more. And he starts like he's kind of becoming part of that community of the Hashira and kind of being able to see them not just as these kind of unstoppable warriors that are something to aspire to, but as people who have their own flaws and their own foibles and their own histories and their own kind of traumas that they are attempting to overcome. And like Gyu, maybe like more than almost anybody else. Um, so much so that he, he like holds himself in such low regard, even though he is an incredible person and Tanjiro kind of showing that to him is really great. And I also love the little moment where Gyu tells Tanjiro um, that he's upset that Tanjiro I has failed to, this, to master yeah. the water breathing style. And he kind of has switched on to his own um, thing. And 
it's like it's a really great little moment of where you realize how much Gyu has faith in and believes in Tanjiro um, and and like has kind of looked on at him as a successor in his own way. Um, and I think it's just like a really powerful little moment that, again, just shows so much of the development of these characters. It feels like you've come so far from the moment when he is lecturing Tanjiro as Tanjiro's like groveling in the sand to now him looking at him as like, you know, I wanted you to be my replacement. I wanted you to become the water Hashira that I never could be. It's so cool to kind of see that coming full circle. Uh, 100%. And this episode also, and I feel like this episode is important to UFO Table in, I think, conceptualizing what the themes of this specific season are and how it plays off of the themes of the previous season, is that Kimetsu no Yaiba is not a story where we are following the genius fighters of this world. They're there. Uh -huh. They're people like Gyome and Sanami who are like on another plane, or Moichiro, right? But they're yeah. not our main characters. You know, Tanjiro is our main character. Giyu is closer to Tanjiro as one of the Hashira, right? Um, and they're not the best at this. They just aren't. Like, Gyu, like Sabito would have been the more, like, the Muichiro level Hashira had he survived, like, is what we see, yeah. right? Like, Sabito was this, like, gifted genius. And it's something we talked about a lot in the Swordsmith Village arc, where it comes up a lot in the contrast between Muichiro and Tanjiro. But, like, it's something this show does that I think is a really interesting tweak to the shonen anime formula, where we're more used to, you know, Son Goku is our main character, and he's the fucking best. And he is a genius at this, and he is gifted, and he has to work hard. But every time you think maybe there's someone more powerful than Son Goku, no, Goku's the best. You think Gohan's gonna uh, surpass Son Goku? No, <laughs> fuck that. Uh, Gohan is is a he becomes the great Saiyan man, and he goes around and goofs off with Videl in his costume, and Goku becomes a Super Saiyan three. Like that is what we get, right? Is like Goku Dude. always is the best. Another thing to maybe correct you here on Terran in your DBZ fan card. Uh, technically, if you're looking at the end of the Majin Buu arc, I would argue that Gohan is the most powerful character. It's easy to forget, but if you're as long as you're ignoring fusions, I would argue very clearly Mystic Gohan or That's Ultimate fair. Gohan or whatever fucking word you want to use for him is the more powerful than Super Saiyan 3 Goku. If he had lived and Goku done his shit properly and saved Gohan at the last moment and brought him to the Supreme Kai's planet, fucking Kid Buu would have been dust. You don't need no Probably, fucking spirit yes. bombs. Gohan's there. Um, so, you know, I, obviously this is not relevant to the actual conversation we're having. I just want to point it out to be <laughs> But, like, that's part of it is that Gohan, like, never... But Gohan doesn't have the fighting instincts to, like, you know, he, yes. he lets himself get eaten and all that stuff, right? Yes. And, of course, true. when you get into the expanded media like GT and Dragon Ball Super, where Goku becomes a literal fucking god, like, uh -huh. you know, there's other things going on. But my point is you're usually, like, your main character is the best. And Tanjiro is pointedly not the best in Kimetsu no Yaiba. Yes. He has to work... He's very good. He's got a lot of, uh, and of course he's very, he sticks, he's got a lot of stick to -itiveness. He sticks with it, but he is not the best. He's not one of the Hashira. He's not a genius like Muichiro or seemingly Sabito was. And Giyu isn't either. Giyu is like uh -huh. also, and Giyu is effectively a big brother to Tanjiro because I think they're very similar. Their people have to work really hard to get where they are. And Giyu, like Tanjiro doesn't really have a lot of doubt or anxiety because he can't really afford to. He's always looking forward. But Giyu has a lot of anxiety over that because he's surrounded by people like Gyome or Sanami or Muichiro who are the best at what they do. Um, and Kimetsu is interested in these characters who walk into a shonen anime and aren't Son Goku, right? And are like, but they mm -hmm. try to get to that level. And I think it is something that this season touches on quite a bit. Yeah, and that, you know, I think it is important that Tanjiro, while he gets very capable, and he's maybe almost at Hashira level, he's never, you know, this is maybe sort of like a spoiler by implication, but he never becomes Hashira level. Like, that's not, and that's not the point. Like, he's he is definitively never the most powerful character yes. in this show, whether you're talking about the demons or the demon slayers. Um, but it's not about who is, like, who is the best sword fighter is not the most important thing here. Um, and yeah, and I think that uh, Giyu does serve that really important contrast where it's like he has committed his life and, you know, you have this whole flashback where Tanjiro realizes or he thinks about the fact that it's like Giyu has to have worked so incredibly hard. Like if the way that Giyu sees himself is as an average person um, who then like, you know, committed himself to trying to live up to the ideal of what Sabito was. But if he truly was never that sort of like truly gifted um, genius level swordsman, like how fucking hard must he have worked to be the kind of person that could jump in at the last moment and save Tanjiro 
against the spider demon with a single stroke of his sword. Like, just imagine how hard this guy must have driven himself to be that. Um, and it moves Tanjiro to tears to think about that. Um, yeah. And I think it is it is very much sort of central to the themes of Demon Slayer about it is it is not about being a genius. It's not about you know, waking up one day and you're, you know, the most powerful person in the world because you've got the demon fox in your body or you turned Super Saiyan or you ate a gum gum fruit or fucking whatever it is. Um, it is that you have worked really, really hard over a very long period of time. You have gotten hurt and had to push through that pain and like learn to grow and move beyond all those things. Um, and you're also someone who has always had a steadfast heart and a compassionate heart. And that that is the most important thing in the world. And that that is that is the blade that will destroy the demons is all those things. Um, and, and, and passing that on through time and like, you know, working with through generationally to make these great things occur. That is what the blade is that destroys the demons. Um, and this is just one of those many pieces that the series puts into place to execute on those ideas. And that's the reason why I think Demon Slayer is like one of the best shows of this style is how laser focused it is yes. on all those sort of central ideas. And you see it in every single episode of this season. But I think episode two is one of the most pointed of them. Yeah, it's, you know, I would say it's it's pointedly not necessarily a deconstruction of shonen anime. It's kind of a reconstruction of like, well, why do these ideas hit so hard? Yeah. Let's really take them down to their root and think about them, and that's what makes it feel so fresh. And, you know, to be clear, this is not the only anime that does some of these things. Jujutsu Kaisen is another one of its generational cohort where I think it's pretty clear about its main character is not a god, you know? Like, mm -hmm. the god is the guy training him over here, you know? Um, but, like, I think Himetsu just does it very, very well and pointedly. And it does things like, you know, Ren Goku was the best of them, and he dies really early in the story. Yeah. And, like, going into the final battle without Ren Goku is a huge handicap for these people. And, you know, Sabito could have been that kind of person, and he died young, because the world is just fucking unfair, and this is hard. And I think there's just, there's things like that that, that, is, that is really well done. Um, unless we uh, forget to say his name, Giyu is voiced by the one and only Takahiro Sakurai, who is really yep. good here, and it's great. I don't know if I'd ever quite registered that that's who it is until this season, because this is when he gets by far the most dialogue. Yeah. Um, but it is very cool that we've got, you know, Cloud slash the teacher from Sound Euphonium being yes. uh, Giyu Tomioka. <laughs> yes, it's Taki Sensei himself is here, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, he just comes into the Hashira training, and all these guys swinging their swords, and he just, like, claps his hand and says... What is this? What is this? Is this an ensemble? Is this like an ensemble? Is this all playing together, guys? Come on. Yes. Uh, so anyway, love that we have our full Giyu episode here. It is great. Thanks for listening to Japanimation Station. If you're enjoying the show, please remember to like and subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and tell your friends. You can support the show directly on Ko-fi at the link in the description. And now... Back to the show. Then episodes three and four are the ones that are most expanded from what is going on in the manga. Episode three is the one where we have the first stop along the Hashira training course with Tengen Uzui and his wives. Uh, and I love this one. It's it's mm -hmm. a very low key episode, obviously, but there's something. There's a lot of fun things going on here. Part of it is just getting a little more time with Tengen, who is a great yeah. character. Getting more time with his wives, who are awesome. And this this episode inaugurates something this season that I really love that is not in the manga, which is getting the perspective of all the other random demon yes. slayers. And like, who the fuck is this Tanjiro guy? Because Tanjiro is so hard for them to understand because he is one of them. He doesn't act like he's elevated. He has no attitude about it. He is very friendly. He doesn't break ranks. But he's also not a Hashira, but he's buddies with all of them. You know, he comes up uh -huh. and Tengen Uzui is this crazy guy missing an eye. He's got three wives. He's whipping them all into shape. And he greets Tanjiro like a brother. And it's uh -huh. just, I love seeing that at every step along the way. Uh, it is a really fun, it's probably my favorite vein of humor in this season, is how they contrast the normal, you know, rank and file demon slayers and Tanjiro, who is technically one of them, but he's not one of them. Yeah, it, it is another thing that's, it's like, you see how Tanjiro, how far he's progressed, that he is like a cut above, like the kind of rank and file. But as you say, a big thing that makes him very different than the Hashira is he never considers himself in that way. And, and 
Um, I do love seeing how much as you go through these episodes and he visits every single Hashida who are, you know, just beating the shit out of all these <laughs> poor dudes. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's a very old school idea of training. I don't know if this is like it realistically would make anybody particularly better at sword fighting. I think they'd all, you know, be pretty useless by the time we're getting to the Infinity Castle because their bones are broken and they're covered in bruises <laughs> and they're completely demoralized. Um, but Tanjiro's there to make them all happy because he's just like this nice, compassionate dude who's there. And you just see how much they all love him and they come to love him and every single cohort of these regular Demon Slayers come to know Tanjiro over the course of him training with each group. Um, and by the time he leaves, they're all like, Tanjiro, like, yeah, like, you know, we'll catch up to you, man. Like, we're, we're brothers. Um, and I love seeing that and how much it feels like, well, Tanjiro is not the most powerful fighter he is like the guy that the Demon Slayer Corps most needs because they need someone like him that can inspire everybody else much more directly. Because the Hashira, they're pillars. They're so distant. They're so like alien to your average person that Tanjiro feels attainable, right? He feels like it's like he has reached a level that most of the rest of them have not. But it's like you see him, you're like, I could be able to do that too because Tanjiro is such a like a down to earth guy. Um, and I do think it is a nice little kind of subtle thing in the background is you feel how much the Hashira training stuff is really enhanced by Tanjiro's participation once he gets involved and that helps everybody become better. And again, I, it's such an important idea to, for this stretch to convey is that it is not just about the Hashira like to to like move this fucking ball past the goal line every single person in the demon slayer core has to put in 110 percent. like that is very much what this kind of fight is everybody's important everybody has to play their part that is what the finale of the series is going to be like hinge upon and so i think putting that extra emphasis that tantra's presence helps elevate people and that's part of his heroism and that's part of what makes him a main character is a really great thing for them to highlight in these extra episodes they put in yeah, when we get back around to the very final battle of the series, don't want to give too much away, but where they are putting in the final push, this will all be important. Yeah. This will matter yes. a lot. Um, Everybody and, matters. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the way you describe him, it's, it's kind of like Tanjiro is the Captain America of the Demon Slayer Corps. <laughs> yes. Like he's technically a superhero, but he doesn't talk to a single person like he is. And so they all get a lot of like... Uh, inspiration from him in the way they wouldn't from like Iron Man who's off doing his billionaire things you know being crazy um, if that I don't know if that comparison makes sense it makes sense to me yeah I, I think I see because especially because like you can imagine if things went a different way and like Tanjiro's generation was not the generation to you know see this Muzan thing to its conclusion um, that he would almost certainly become the sort of like lead figure of the Demon Slayer core even if yeah. he didn't end up being the best fighter like right. either way, like he as a person is a like natural born leader in the Captain America esque kind of way that he inspires you because he leads by example and he never feels like he's out of reach or out of touch. Um, it's leadership always, through humility, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, I love all of that stuff. This is a fun episode. This episode is where you also start to get to see the scenes. And these are also anime original of the different Hashira dueling each other at night uh -huh. as sparring because the actual training isn't enough for them. And that's, that is, those scenes are mostly an excuse for Ufo Table to go, we haven't get, gotten to draw enough action this season. Let's cut loose. And they do uh -huh. cut loose in very impressive ways in those scenes. But I do like them. I like seeing that like Sanami and Obanai, uh, the, the, or Iguro, they have a weird kind of friendship, even though those guys uh -huh. don't seem very friendly. I like seeing that, like, oh, these are all, at, at the very minimum, they're all co-workers. And they have a mm -hmm. kind of bond. And, and those are just nice scenes to see. Because a lot of Infinity Castle will be the Hashira bouncing off each other in different combinations. It's good to have. Yeah, and it's just, like, nice to see their, like, different contrasting fighting styles. And get their, like, wind breathing, one, blah, 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 and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Like just because we haven't seen these guys fight ever. Um, and so getting to see how much Shinazagawa is this like, you know, big brutal force of nature with his wind style and like trying to just like push these big attacks through. And then Igudo is this very tricky um, guy with his snake style and his attacks come from very unpredictable, uh, unpredictable directions. Like you just getting sort of like used to how these people fight is nice. Um, and I think it, it just like, Again, it is nice setup for where we will see in the movies when they have like proper big fights with the upper rank demons. 
Episode four is the Muichiro episode, which is also mostly not in the manga. And the big thing it adds is all the stuff with the paper airplanes, which mm-hmm. did lead me down a weird research rabbit hole where I went, yeah. this is early Taisho era. And the his- the fact that it is early Taisho era is very important to the plot of Kimetsu. You, to yeah. degrees that probably if you haven't read the manga, you don't realize yet. But like it is, it is rooted in history. Would they have things called paper airplanes? The airplane would technically exist by, this would be like 1912, 10s-ish. It would exist. Would they have paper airplanes? I looked it up. There were basically what we call paper airplanes existed all throughout the 19th century before there were airplanes. They were usually called paper darts. I don't know what they were called in Japan. In the episode, they just used the term kami hikoke, which just means paper airplane. It might have been a different term back then, but especially in a culture like Japan that had so much origami throughout history, they would have had these. They just might not have been called that. But uh, I did look, I was like happy to see like, oh, this actually Mm -hmm. is not breaking the history. This does, this does fit. Yeah, that's why I had the exact same thought when I watched yeah. the episode. In fact, I remember I watched this episode earlier than you because I saw your Twitter thread on it. And yeah. I was like, I already went down this rabbit hole. <laughs> um, and I, I struggled to try to find if there was a, a pre-existing term other than Kami Hikoki because there were multiple article like we are the, are not the only people who had this thought because there were multiple articles written in Japanese on the Internet okay. when this episode came nice. out being like, did you wonder if the the Kami Hikoki in this episode of Kimetsu Yaiba like would have actually existed? It's like, well, let's briefly look at the history of the Kami Hikoki. But they never referred to it as any other term. I don't know yeah. if that's because that is just what it was called. I mean, it's not certainly impossible um, because the kanji would have just been obviously Kami for paper. He is flying, Ko is move, and Ki is machine. And so it's like, it's not outside the realm of possibility they would have just used that term. It's also possible that like, those articles just didn't bother to look up if there was a pre-existing term. And I did not know where to look to find that. So maybe there's another term. Maybe it's just Kami Hikoki. Who knows? But I I've, I've, I've appreciated this episode is totally historically plausible with what, I mean, in terms of the airplane thing and stuff <laughs> and the, you know, yeah. the wind breathing, all that. that that's a maybe a little bit outside plausibility. But they definitely could have made airplanes, paper airplanes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, Hayao Miyazaki would love this episode. You know, because yes. this is about the flying machine. He's like, fine, I watched 60 episodes of this fucking show. No one's doing any flying. We get a little bit of flying <laughs> finally. Uh, Ka- Hayao Miyazaki has not seen Kimetsu no Yaiba. No. Uh, there's, there have actually been articles on this. Someone asked him once while he was trying to clean his local river, and he said, look, I'm just an old man trying to clean my river, and that is why we love Hayao Miyazaki. Yes. <laughs> anyway, but yes, it's a good episode. I like the paper airplane thing. It's It's... It comes slightly out of left field, but I think it it's it, it, it purposefully because Muichiro is so kind of closed off that it, it makes sense that he would have some kind of hobby. We wouldn't have seen it. Now he's open enough with Tanjiro to show it. And Tanjiro does this the same way he did his stupid soba eating contest. And I think it's delightful. Yeah. And it's it's obviously like it's, it's part of that thing. It's I think it's here to emphasize what Tanjiro is able to do, which is bring all these people together. Yeah. And make the training actually effective because Muichiro's training was so brutal um, that they were not getting anything out of that. And then when Tanjiro shows up, he's able to kind of build that bridge and show that they are all on the t- same team. We're all human beings right here. Um, and building that connection is really vital to making it feel like after Tanjiro leaves that that training is going to probably be way more useful and effective now that he has helped build that bridge between Muichiro and the other uh, trainees. Because one thing, and I believe this is a joke in the manga as well, but it's they really kind of double down on it here, is the whole thing of where Muichiro is like the coldest, harshest person to all these random people. And then Tanjiro shows up. He's like, oh, Tanjiro. Yes. Oh, hey. Oh, my God. And it's just the way he just completely turns into a different person is hilarious. Um, and, uh, and all the other Demon Slayer guys just being like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yes. Like, what the hell is happening here? Um, well, because really it's like it, Muichiro is like that to Tanjiro when they first meet. Yes. Because he's someone who is very close off and is not good at making friends. But you realize Muichiro wants friends. He's nice when he has friends. And so he'll do it with Tanjiro. And this episode is about Tanjiro being like, you can do this to every everyone can be your friend. Everyone yeah. likes you. There's no reason you can't. And and that is such a Tanjiro thing to do. The episode is literally called to bring a smile to one's face. And it is what it is about. It's, you know, it's a very lightweight episode, but I think in a way that is necessary and fun at this point in the story. Um, yeah, I like and I just I like seeing Muichiro smiling. He's had a hard life. Yeah, you know, it's nice to see him just be happy. It's like, oh, my God, Tanjiro. Oh, I'm so happy you're here. 
Yes, it is. If you have not seen that page in the manga, it's chapter 132. Go look it up. The exaggerated drawings of Happy Muichiro in the manga, which is much more sketchy than the you know anime yeah. is, is very, very funny. Yeah. So love this one. Episode five, I even ate demons, which is a line of Genya's, because the second half of this episode is brutal brother drama. The first half is going through a couple of things like we get... Um, Kanroji's stage, which they keep... I think this is smart. They don't try to expand that one into an episode because it is such a single-page manga joke of okay. him, her putting everybody in ballet tutus and having them dance. And so I think they do the right thing there. With um, Iguro's stage, they... As you, you mentioned this before, about expanding that scene where he has to swing the sword between all the other demon slayers, and that's fun. And that's the first half of the episode. And then the second half is all the stuff with Sanami and Genya. So it's actually kind of a jam-packed episode, but it's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, and I do really love all the stuff they do with Igdo's training in just like, just one, because it's so fucked up. Um, you yes. know, it's, it's so cruel to Tanjiro. Um, but I love seeing the the evolution there of him being so careful and not being able to properly fight. And then the sequence where he's kind of mastered this training and in his mind's eye, he's just like, no, it's just like fighting in a forest or it's like fighting anywhere that's close quarters where you can't just swing your sword any random direction you're going to catch onto something and as he starts visualizing that way he's actually able to kind of have some back and forth with you know like that whole sequence i think is really good um this is one where you do wonder what anybody else is getting out of any of that training i guess maybe there's a little bit of like training your um spirit or something you know it's like it's calvin's dad from calvin hobbs bill's character i guess i don't yes. know um but you know they're all most of everyone else just gets tied up to posts and watches as they almost get hit in the face with a wooden sword over and over and over again um, it is both the best and the worst training any of the hasher have devised yes because for the person doing it it's actually a very good training that will come in handy in a lot of ways because it's 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 very smart. For everybody else, it is just pure terrorism and um, Igor is kind of a dick. But, yeah. you know, it's funny. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's just, it's just it's a good sequence. I like what it does to kind of develop Tantra as a fighter. But yeah, yeah. then you get all the stuff with the Shizunazagawa brothers um, and see just how intense <laughs> that gets. Um, yeah, it, obviously this is all like really setting up a lot of stuff that's going to be very good payoff for the movies of the relationship between these two brothers, Ginya's whole deal with him eating demons and all that stuff. Um, you know, like we notably, you know, at this stage in the story, we have not yet gotten the big flashback that's going to explain all of this stuff um, and where these two brothers come from, where they diverged and all that. Um, but it's all really juicy, dramatic material that's going to be good payoff for later. Yeah, it's it's something that... Just, just, just trust us. The payoff yeah. in there's going to be a lot of tears in the theater in Infinity Castle movie two or whichever one it is when we get the full uh, explication of what happens and how their relationship winds up. But I think this episode does a good job laying it all down. Um, one other thing I want to say that they start doing here in this uh, episode and, and the surrounding episodes too is giving more hints about Iguro and Kanroji having a little thing together. Mm -hmm. And I like that because that'll come up a lot in the final arc. And I and I don't remember it being hinted at as much in the manga. I haven't gone through and done a whole inventory of that. But I like that there's the little things of like, definitely there's Iguro is jealous in the manga about Tanjiro being close to Kanroji. But you get the whole thing that they're pen pals and all of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, just any time we have more Kana Hanazawa. I like. She's great. Yeah. Um, so it's good. Yeah, they definitely load up more of that kind of implication of that relationship between these two here than I think at this stage um, in the manga. You also get, I think like this is kind of here and it's spread out, I think a little bit in the next couple episodes as well, but with Shinazagawa as we're talking about the stuff with him, I do love you get all the stuff with like I think this is later when Tanjiro shows up and he's training with um, Giyu or they're having like the sparring match and Tanjiro's whole thing of it's like, oh, but you love, I forget what it is, it's not Anko, um, it's something like that. It's some like It's Japanese like red bean sweet. soup or something, yeah. Yeah, um, I think it might be uh, Daifuku maybe is what it was. It's Daifuku, remember. yes, that's what it yeah. is, yeah. And he's just like, oh, you know, but here I brought some Daifuku for you. He's like, I know you love Daifuku. He's like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, every time when we were training, you went back into the thing when you were really exasperated and you came out and you seemed happier and you, you know, you smelled like red bean paste and Daifuku. So, you know, I thought, yeah, you must really love Daifuku. He's like, shut up right now. <laughs> yes. Um, and that whole big bit is, is so funny. And I just love, <laughs> I just love all that stuff. I love that, you know, there's this 
obviously there is a, a softer human side to Shinazagawa that he has buried deep, 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 deep down inside. But but Tanjiro's nose doesn't fail him, and that dude loves himself some Daifuku. Yes, I, it's, it's, this is good stuff because it's making you think Sonami is the biggest fucking dick on the planet, which is what you need going into the next arc because it's gonna, it's gonna challenge your expectations about this yeah. character and it's good stuff. Um, but I like that. I like that they also expand the, the ending of this episode and, and it's role in the manga to basically Tanjiro leading a revolt of the demon slayers against Sonami Shinazagawa uh-huh. and then having it re, and then his training gets revoked and he's like, uh, suspended from it by the the Kasagai crow comes and like chews him out and all that stuff. It's a very funny way they kind of expand yeah. on that bit in the manga. There's like a demon slayer restraining order between the two of them or something yes. where it's like you can't be within like a hundred yards of each other. Um, which obviously <laughs> he violates when he uh, stumbles on their training with Gyu um, and does the whole dive yeah. thing. But yes, like that, all that stuff is very funny. Yep. Episode six is the one with Gyome's training stage. This is also an episode where we get a lot of Zenitsu and Inosuke again. This is, I believe, the episode where I had my Twitter profile for like a year and a half was a panel from the manga of Inosuke. And I had completely forgotten the context of this, where he had um, like two things of, uh, oh, what's the food? The fried Japanese. It's like uh, yaki. Oh, tempura. Yeah, tempura. He has two pieces of tempura, and he has the next issue yelling, tempura! And he's got the mask on, and I took that panel and made it my Twitter profile for like a year and a half, and this is the episode finally, like five years later from when I read the manga, where it is adapted, and there is the panel, and I've, I've needed, I need to go in and like get a screenshot of this so I can have the color anime version of that profile uh-huh. pic, although it is not as funny when he isn't just on screen. It says, tempura! Because it says it on both sides of the panel. It's very mm-hmm. good, but we got that joke here. Not important to the plot of the episode, but I wanted to mention it this one is both about um Gyome having an absolutely <laughs> crazy hard training uh, with the boulder and everything and we learn about repetitive action and that whole thing it is also where i believe we get the setup for zenitsu's whole thing oh no no that's in the next one is where we get the oh, setup yeah. for zenitsu going off this will be paid off in the next arc but yeah this one is mostly about the the repetitive action technique and all of that stuff which sounds very painful yeah, uh, this is also where you get uh, everybody's favorite character that everyone was just asking the entire time through the past two arcs. Where is Murata? Well, here he is. And you know that Murata is, he's hes a hes a badass motherfucker because he's made it all the way up to Guillaume's training, which I yes. think in the manga does not like register like such a big deal because you didn't really see the other training. But the yes. fact that he's here in the anime, you've had like multiple episodes going through all the shit he would have had to have done to get to this point. You're like, God damn, Murata, like, you're you're not so bad. Like, holy shit, for, you got all For those who don't remember, Murata is the one we met on the, the mountain where Tanjiro fights Rui yes. and all of that stuff. And he's kept showing up in the background of different scenes. So he's like, he's probably within the general Demon Slayer core, one of the best. He's just not Tanjiro, Inosuke, Zenitsu. So we don't see him as much. But as you say, he got up to Gyome. He's doing pretty good. Yeah, because he's, he's like the character that is like the face for the random demon slayer dudes, you know, of like, that's just like what that character is. Um, yeah. He's the character that they, they made the, um, that one, the cyber connect two game, um, which is a decent little uh, demon slayer game. And he's a playable character in that. And it's very, you know, he's like the joke character and he's like the Mr. Satan of that game. Yeah. And it's very funny. Um, yeah. And it's just like, nice to see him and he's up here and they're all like, ah, oh, Murata son. And it's like, yeah. And they're, and I love, I just love all the little jokes of them, you know, trying to sort of meditate under the waterfall and getting swept away into the river yes. and drowning and, and Tom's just being like, Zenitsu! Zenitsu! And chasing after him. Like, yeah, there's just a lot of stuff like that in this episode. is very fun. This is definitely a season where Hanai Natsuki gets to stretch his comedy muscles, which uh-huh. are... He has very adept comedy muscles from yes. a bunch of other shows. He doesn't get to use them as much in certainly the last couple seasons of Demon Slayer that have been like all battle. Um, but this is a season where Ka- Hanai Natsuki is really funny this entire season. And uh, like, I'm glad we stopped for a second to, to um, acknowledge that. Genya also is in this one as the person who introduces mm-hmm. repetitive action and that whole thing. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting concept. I, I always love all the breathing techniques and all these ideas that they kind of come up with in this series. And this one obviously will come up again in the final arc as we're saying with everything but it's a cool introduction to that idea yeah and obviously it's sort of set up for the next episode when we get into Gyome's whole deal because you know him as the buddhist priest and his namunami dabutsu and his sutras and like him saying that over and over and over again which is that is what he's been doing this whole time right and that's like yes. how he has attained his 
sort of superhuman strength is through this incredible focus on these specific moments and clearing his mind using the sutures and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's it's all good set up for that stuff. But it is, you know, this whole sequence is about getting to uh, episode seven where you get Gome here. Um, first, you get, um, a, I love how they do the moment of Tanjiro pushing the boulder, which kind of splits across the two episodes um, where, you know, just the like, that's where you get some good, you know, we've had some a little bit of good comedy Hanai Natsuki. This is where you get good action screaming at the top of my lungs Hanai Natsuki of the, like, just primal roar Tanjiro gives as he's trying to move this giant fucking boulder. Um, and just like, yeah, and just digging himself in and really pushing. He's like barely able to move it. And that's the end of episode six. And then episode, the beginning of episode seven is him being like, I can't stop. Like, if I stop, I will not be able to push this fucking boulder again. So he keeps on pushing it and pushing it and pushing it to the point where he almost fucking dies from exhaustion and dehydration from expanding himself so hard. And that's where Gyome comes in. And I really like that whole sequence of seeing, like, how intense this is for Tanjiro and how hard he has to push himself. Um, and, and obviously that then being a thing you have in the back of your mind when you see Gyome who can do this shit like it's nothing. And it's like, how crazy is this guy that this is his training and this is how far he's pushed himself that he considers this training. You know, this is like something, this is like his morning, like warm up or whatever is pushing this boulder a mile or whatever it is. Yes. It's crazy. This is a slight non sequitur, but I just, I don't know where else I want to, I'm going to say it. And I think it's funny. I went to the theatrical like premiere event they did last week for Don to Don, which is the new science Saru anime mm -hmm. that's premiering in October. And they, it was a thing where they showed the first three episodes and they had a big interview section and they, Hanai Natsuki is the main character in Don to Don. Um, and that is very much a comedy role for him. And he's very funny in it. But so they had him on screen with the main actress from the show and they were talking. And I guess I'd never, I've listened to Hanai Natsuki a lot. I've watched like videos on his YouTube channel but that's usually voiceover and I realized I hadn't seen him talk a lot and mm -hmm. I say this with absolute love Hanai Natsuki looks like a total dork and I fucking love it <laughs> yeah. he is such a nerd he is like he does not look like you know there are some voice actors who look like fucking movie stars uh, you know we just talked about Takahiro Sakurai that dude looks very good in a suit yes. in all of his photos and stuff right um, Hanai Natsuki is a dork and I love him and it is extra funny when you imagine him doing like the crazy demon slayer yells and everything um, I just love that, that that guy has a voice that can do anything and he has the body of an otaku and I love him for it yeah I do I do like Hanai Natsuki's whole like look where he's got like his big glasses he's got you know he's got an incredibly round face yep um and like particularly kind of small eyes so he's got that kind of like Japanese facial features when he smiles his eyes kind of disappear a little bit like like he kind of looks like an anime character right like you wouldn't have to go that far to turn him into an anime character of Notaku who with like the big goofy glasses and his like eyes are like very narrow little like smiley that's the character almost. in Don to Don he looks like the character in this okay, new anime yeah. it's great yeah 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 it's you're right. It's a non sequitur, but it is, you know, I'm always here to appreciate Hanai Natsuki. I'm an avid uh, viewer of his, his YouTube videos. Um, and yes, like I love his whole his yeah. whole vibe. He only has done a couple of videos on his YouTube channel. Sometimes when he does horror games that use the webcam. I wish he did more webcam stuff. Usually I don't like it when streamers put their webcam stuff in. I find it distracting, but he's a very expressive person. So when he yeah. does his horror game stuff, it's, he's, you know, I like that. dude. Yeah. He's cool. Yeah, this is not us making fun of him. This is like, I love what it just, he is the biggest like fucking anime star in the world. He's flying around to all these Kimetsu premiere events in every country on earth. And he's so normal. It's the thing that's yes. funny, you know? Yeah. Anyway, that is a non sequitur. But let's talk about another great actor in Tomokazu Sugita, who just basically narrates all of episode seven because it's mm -hmm. primarily a flashback with his silky, smooth, deep, beautiful voice. And oh, it is so good. This is a 31 minute episode. I What is the time slot for that on Japanese TV? I have no idea. I guess a 45 minute. What is the other 15? I have no idea. But UFO Table can do whatever they want. And this is an episode that I think earns its length because it is very good. Yeah, it is. It is so funny because you look at that episode length and you're like, well, this just must be a streaming show. And it's like, no, yeah. I mean, this just airs on regular TV. I mean, almost all the other episodes other than the first episode, this episode and the last one are all regular 24 minute length episodes. Um, yeah, so this one is 31 minutes, which is such a weird, yes. <laughs> it's so, such an unusual length of episodes. They've done um, it one other time, but it was for the season two finale of the Entertainment District arc. Isn't quite, it's not double length. It's like one and a half length. This is that length. Um, 
episodes one and eight of this season are just double length, so it can air in an hour long time slot. Nothing hard about that. I just always think this is a very unusual length, but uh, I think it works particularly. I mean, this one is also the one that ends with the extreme slow motion scene of Muzan walking into the mansion, which is, I think, a really good tension piece to kick us into the finale. Um, But yeah, this this one is primarily Gilmay's flashback, which is I'd kind of forgotten from the manga just how fucking tragic it is, because it isn't just that this demon. So he had been taking care of all these kids And not only does a demon come in and kill them, um, but that the demon was let in by one of the kids who betrayed everyone else. Mm -hmm. And then when Gyome breaks and becomes violent, killing the demon, this, the one girl who survived blames him because she's confused by what she saw and he is thrown in prison. And then it's Ubiyashiki who comes and gets him out and believes him that he didn't murder anybody, which is part of why, you know, uh, he trusts Ubiyashiki so much. But God, he has... I mean, everybody in the Demon Slayer Corps has lost people, but that is a level of, like, losing people and parts of yourself that a lot of them have not been through. Yeah, because I, th- I think one of the things that sets Gyome's whole deal apart compared to the other Demon Slayers is that his backstory feels more similar to the backstory that a lot of the demons have. Um, you know, if you That's think true. about, like, our Pleasure District demons, the brother and sister um, who were, you know, grew up in this really awful circumstances and were used and betrayed by basically everyone they encountered. Um, and they have these very tragic lives, right, that then lead them into being demons. Um, Gomez is not about, like, the demon doing something horrible. I mean, obviously it is to a certain extent because the demon kills the kids. But the root thing is his lack of ability to trust and his, like, lack of faith. And, he, you know, what he tells Tantros here is that he is always suspicious of people. He does not have the ability to trust people. He was suspicious of Tandro. He has been suspicious of him since the moment he met him. Um, and it's in this moment of seeing Tandro's dedication to the training and everything he's been doing that Guillaume is able to um, sort of have those doubts cleared and he like converts that into sort of like pure faith. And he sees Tandra as like the kind of person that they need, the kind of pure compassionate person that the Demon Slayer core needs at its heart. Um, Cause I think Guillaume probably is somewhat similar to Giyu in the respect of that. I think he does not have a particularly high opinion of himself, um, you know, because of like everything that's happened in his, I think he wants to be able to trust people and cannot really bring himself to do it um, because of those, those experiences he's had. But it, it's what makes his dedication to fighting the demons and the fact that he has not let that experience of being betrayed by these kids he was, two of the kids he was trying to protect, lead to him have like a hatred of people or like working against people, that it is him fighting for humanity in spite of those things is one of the things that makes me really like the character. It just gives him a very different quality than the other demon slayers who are basically all characterized by some very direct tragedy that a demon caused and that they are fighting like Tanjiro, you know, they all have that kind of backstory. A demon killed my whole family and now I'm in, you know, turned one of my family members into a demon that I then had to kill. And so I am like driven by an hatred for the demons and a need to destroy them. Um, and Gyome's backstory is a lot more complicated than that. And I think it's one of the things that him being an adult helps build that complexity um, in the way that he looks at them, all the other Demon Slayer cores as kind of like the same as the children that he protected and that was betrayed by. Um, it just lends this character a lot more shades of gray than I think the other Demon Slayers have. 100%. And I, I hadn't thought about it that way, but when you say the thing about, you know, he has a more demon-esque backstory, it makes you think about, like, well, what if an Ubuyashiki-style figure had come to the the brother and sister from yes. season two at their lowest moment and lifted them up? Um, and what if Muzan Kibutsuji had gotten to Gyome first? Uh-huh. He would be one of the upper rank demons that they would be yeah. fighting, you know? And it's, it's, uh, and, and I think that it lends itself to that reading, even though it doesn't say that explicitly, because this episode ends with Muzan coming to talk to Ubuyashiki and the two parent figures meeting and us having seen this range of like, what the good parent can do versus what the abusive parent can do over the life of this series, but also in this one episode of that, you know, Ubuyashiki in a very real way redeemed this guy who could have fallen into a real hatred for humanity for completely understandable reasons in the same way that a lot of the demon backstories, you don't walk away going, that guy was crazy. You go, 
I feel kind of bad for them. You know, that's what Tanjiro mm-hmm. keeps yeah. keeps learning. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's it kicks us. In. It's again, it's the thing where Ufo Table is just so good at building these stretches into really good anime arcs, where I think you come into the the final stretch here and then the finale with a real sense of. Not just the stakes, we know the stakes for the world, but I think the stakes for the souls of these characters and what they say thematically, that is what we have when we get Muzan's slow motion walk at the end of this one. Yeah, and I love, I adore how they do this whole thing at the end of this episode where, you know, they they lend this moment of Muzan arriving at Ubiashki's manor with this sort of incredible mythic weight, which, which feels so appropriate because it is... You know, obviously, this is the moment that's going to send us into the whole climactic arc of the series. But it is also the thing that we have ultimately been building up to is these two figures who are, you know, reflections of each other, Ubiyashiki and Muzan, like them having this direct confrontation. It's it's like Yoda fighting the Emperor in the prequel in episode three or something like that. It is this like, you know, meeting of the two sort of masterminds of the two primary factions. But they just milk this moment for everything it's worth. And then they go to credits and then they milk it even more after the credits. It's something I love. Like you have a big long sequence of him walking up and like going to the boundary where the door is and stepping across the boundary. And then you go into the credits and then like halfway through the credits, you start getting shots of Muzan and things like that. And you start realize like, oh, this isn't just like the normal ending credits theme. Also, because if you paused the episode, you'd have saw that there's like three more minutes later. Right. Um, and then you just get even more of him walking up through the courtyard in super slow motion until it's, you know, he and Ubiyashiki basically meet eyes. And that's where it more or less ends. Um, but it's, I love that they, they milk it in slow motion. They go to credits and then they just come back for more. Um, to just, again, it just in, lends it this incredible weight of myth of, here are these two titanic figures finally coming into contact that will then lead us into the climax of the story a very long climax but this is this is the true point of no return is muzan has arrived at the doorstep of the demon slayer core which leads us into episode eight which i i think it is it is competitive but I think this might be the best episode of Demon Slayer. If you're just talking about individual installments of TV, it's this. Mm-hmm. It's Hinokami from season one, episode 19. It's, you know, maybe the the penultimate episode of the Entertainment District arc is a fucking banger. You know, yeah. there's a lot of good ones to pick from. But I think the thing that sets this episode apart is it is this pressure cooker of tension. I think on the level of direction, this is a, like 40 minutes of filmmaking to study if you want to understand how you build and release tension in a piece of filmmaking. Um... Because one thing that shocked me right off the bat is how simple the direction in the first half of this episode is. When it is the conversation between Ubuyashiki and Muzan, there is a, what is the word for this? There's like a, a he- not hesitation, they're, they're holding themselves back from going full UFO table for a while here. Mm-hmm. It is a real discipline is the word I'm looking for. Of the storyboarding is extraordinarily simple. Of these straight on shots, They're not putting any spin on the ball. It is just focusing you in on these people talking to the degree that there are some very static shots that are not characteristic of Ufo Table's work at all. They like to do crazy things with their shots, right? Um, As we have (laughs) learned from many Ufo Table things we've talked about. Well, as they do for the whole sequence of him walking up is this incredibly elaborate, complicated sequence that is like, if you're trying to define what is like the Ufo Table, like the modern Ufo Table style, Showing someone that whole sequence of him walking up is exactly it. Like no other anime studio would ever make anything even approximating or getting close to that whole sequence, how they blend the background, the use of the effect of like the mist on top of the image and all that kind of stuff. It's such a rich, deep use of a blending of 2D and 3D for doing what is a mundane thing of a dude walking across a courtyard in the most elaborate and complicated way you could have possibly done an animation. And so having that contrast because they redo a lot of that sequence at the beginning of episode eight and then you're right then that is contrasted with this very simple stripped down very disciplined conversation and like how you depict that conversation between these two people and the fact that there is no spin on the ball that it is just talking makes it so tense because you know at any moment like, Ubuyashiki is on death's door. He has no way of fighting back. Muzan is infinitely powerful. We know all the stakes here. And because there's nothing in the filmmaking kind of juicing it for us, telling us what is coming, it puts us on a knife's edge. 
And then when it fully starts to, I mean, when it literally explodes, the place explodes, the place blows up. Like everybody is kind of running because they've read the crows, let them know. And then you have a literal explosion, which I don't know if I'm sure we've seen a new table explosion before, but this looks like a fucking $200 million Hollywood explosion scene. Like the way they do it, it just at a certain point doesn't even look like animation. There's like a photorealism to it. And the way they do the slow motion of like the, the, the like the floorboards under their feet billowing out and all of that stuff is incredible. And, and so you have that, a literal pressure cooker that explodes into the second half of this episode, which has some of the craziest animation we've ever seen from them, that has all of the stuff of Muzan's body regenerating, that has Gyome coming out and trying to battle him, that you also have um, Tamiyo come in and stab him with the, the poison that she's giving him, and all of this stuff pays off. Like, I... It's hard for me to remember the last time I watched an episode of anime on my TV and was that far forward in my seat, completely breathless. And then when the world opens up from under them and, you know, I knew this was coming. I knew every uh-huh. beat of what was coming. I'd recently reread the manga. Even if I didn't, I remember this moment very well. It's when they fall into the infinite castle, but they do it. The musical cue that they use under that scene, the way they show all our other major characters like Inosuke and Zenitsu falling in. And we have these big moments with everyone falling into that infinite void. And you end with Tanjiro just screaming. I will, you know, I, if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to kill you, Muzan Kibutsuji hard cut to black with the music continuing I literally stood up off my couch and like was like Jesus Christ like it is the hardest mic drop I think I've ever seen for like a anime cliffhanger and I knew it was coming and I know what comes next and it didn't matter it is so phenomenally well done yeah it's it's incredible and I think it is that thing of where it's a it's a double length episode and I think when you're going into that you think like there's going to be a lot of stuff that happens. And really, there's not in the sense of like, there's not like huge phases to this episode where like there's multiple big plot turns and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Really, they use that double length to give that conversation that is really like the whole first half of this episode as much space as they possibly can, because it is so important. And it's a big scene in the manga, obviously, as well, um, where you have, you know, our two kind of like, opposing viewpoints and it's a a really important moment for the series to stop and really kind of put a you know needle into exactly like what is this story about and what is Muzan's whole deal like what is his perspective what does he want what is he trying to achieve and how does that contrast with Ubayashiki who represents the whole Demon Slayer core and I love that back and forth and the contrast of those two figures is so potent that Ubayashiki is this sick man on his deathbed you know he says like I should have died weeks ago um and no and like my doctors are like stunned that I've managed to hang on um but I knew that like I had to keep going until I met you um and then you have Muzan who is I love how they draw Muzan here is he's almost like disgusting and how perfect and kind of flawless he looks. He's almost doll like um, with he's got like I feel like they've exaggerated like the size of his eyes and his complexion just feels so perfect. Um, again, it's especially because you have that in contrast with this other dude who's covered in bandages and has this like gross purple, like mot- mottled skin um, and shit like that, 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 you know, Ubiashki is in very bad shape here. And Muzan is this almost like inhuman mannequin looking figure. Um, and, you know, you would think that Muzan would carry all the real power in this conversation. Um, but he is like, if you're looking at this as a sort of like debate between the two people, like he is so, he, he's so on his back foot in failing in that debate. He has no really good argument to make for what he's trying to do. He keeps on leaning back on this, like you're disgusting, like looking at you makes me sick. Like I, I'm so disappointed in you, you, the great, like the Ubiashki, you know, the the head, the leader of the demon slayer in this generation, like, you know, like this is what you have been reduced to. Um, he keeps on leaning on all that stuff. And Ubiashki keeps on coming back with these very, like, kind of potent, very incisive observations about the difference between them and what the Demon Slayer core has accomplished, leading up to this incredible moment that's this amazing mic drop that's also, like, a big full-page spread in the manga of all these little, like, kind of, 
you know, argumentative seeds that he's planting around like this contrast he's drawing with like the Demon Slayer core that's been fighting Muzan for a thousand years and all this stuff and how hard Ubiashki is like trying to fight on for a life, whereas like Muzan has basically been living forever. Um, and then Ubiashki has this um, reveal where it's like, you know, like we have all these generations that have been fighting. And the thing is that when I die, it will spur on my children after me and they will come and they will kill you. Because the thing is, if you die, all the demons die too, right? And he ends with this little zinger, this drop that puts Muzan back that like is such a great moment because it both is like a thing of like from like a I don't know a military tactics perspective or something if they kill Muzan they have won the whole war because all of their enemies will be defeated in that single swoop but really what he is saying there is he's drawing that line in the contrast um that is whatever happens to Ubiashki doesn't matter he's going to die he was always going to die whether his family bloodline was cursed or not he's mortal he was going to die but all these things will live on after him into eternity. Whereas for Muzan, when he dies, everything ends. There will be nobody to remember him. There will be nobody to care about him. All of his children, all of his legacy, everything he has built up for the thousand plus years life he has, all of that will be gone in a puff of smoke in an instant. And that is like that contrast of the... Muzan's desire is eternity and eternal life. And that is the thing that has motivated him for his entire, like, pathetic, incredibly cowardly life. And you feel how much of a coward Muzan is in this episode, which I love because that's to me is like his defining characteristic is he's just this, like, horrible coward. Um, and Ubiashki is this incredibly noble, brave person who is willing to sacrifice and give up everything because he knows that everything he has and everything that he is, that will, will live on after him and that he has achieved a true form of eternity that Muzan will never be able to have because he is, Muzan is the one who's truly cursed. You know, Muzan has this moment where he says, um, you know, like, it's amusing to me, you know, that your whole bloodline is cursed. I don't believe any of that stuff because there has never been a God or a Buddha or anything that has ever appeared and done anything to me. And it's this moment of where you see how blind Muzan is because his entire existence is a curse. Like he himself is cursed. He will have nothing and he will gain nothing and he will achieve nothing in this life. And then the more spiritualistic worldview of Kimetsu no Yaiba where you have, you know, the cycle of reincarnation and things like that. And we have seen that there exists an afterlife, that there will be nothing for him in that either and he has given up everything for this sad little cowardly existence where he has no joy and no love and nothing in his life all he ever does is live in fear of dying and you have Ubiyashki who is on the verge of death and all he cares about is life and joy and his children in the Demon Slayer Corps and it's like that contrast in that moment and how they build up that visually through direction and obviously through Gotoge Sensei's great dialogue from the manga, so much of which is just like word for word and the kind of like the pacing of that dialogue. Um, and then the performances of our two actors that are just, these are two actors at the top of their game. They're two of the best actors in the entire business and they are just at the top of their game in this scene. It is so juicy. It's so powerful and it just gets all of the themes and the ideas of what the series has always been about down to an absolute T, thus leading us into us seeing how these themes are all going to play out on a very grand epic stage with the various fights we're going to get in the movie trilogy. Yes. And, you know, I would say, and I'm, you laid that out really well there, Sean, because I think this scene is the clearest statement of what this series is about. We get until I would say the final chapter. And yeah. I don't want to spoil what the final chapter is, but it is a final chapter that crystallizes what this series was always about and yeah. what this series was always about is it is it is about death and it is about the way it is about both the fear of death and the power humans get from being mortal it is like that yeah. is the thing that this series is fundamentally about and it is using the idea of demons as this thematic exploration of you know, what would the opposite be of our, you know, mortality is very, very scary and it makes us very vulnerable, but what would the alternative be? Um, and it is so what this series is about and it crystallizes so well here that I think part of, you know, I was talking about kind of the tension and release. Part of it is that when you get to the moment of release, you have now had clarified for you what the stakes of Kimetsu no Yaiba are and what mm -hmm. this show is about. And Ubu Yashiki dies completely at peace to the degree that he sacrifices his fucking wife along with him. Right. And she's yeah. totally there for it to 
like because they know there is something bigger going on here that life is bigger than an individual there's i think a very beautiful kind of essence of spirituality to all of this um and then it is literally paid off in the next second when all of his children just dive in yeah. like this is the most important thing they have ever done in their life, right? Um, and then, of course, that does not resolve things. They are sent into the hell that Muzan has built, but they also have the pieces they need to win. And that's what the rest of this series is going to be about. That's the climax. And when I say like it feels like such an unbelievable mic drop, it's both because of the filmmaking of the episode, but also the, the story material that is there in the manga that they have teased out in such perfect cinematic fashion that, you know, it's it's hard not to like stand up and run around the room at the fucking cliffhanger that they've just done, even if you know how the whole thing ends, because they have sunk the hook in so deep into you as a viewer to want to see what comes next. It's so perfect. Yeah, it's great. And and I, I really want to particularly shout out um, here uh, Toshiko Seki as Kibitsuji Muzan and the stuff they do with him in particular. Because Muzan is like, you know, he's the big bad of the series, but partially because he is the big bad and he's so powerful, you, you know, you don't get a huge amount of screen time with him. But I think I just love Muzan as a villain. And I and this isn't even like thinking about obviously there, there's the stuff that will happen with him in the finale, the stuff that we haven't gotten to. But even with just like the material we've seen, I love the way that Muzan is characterized, where he fits broadly in an archetype of fiction that you would be familiar with. You know, he's a very like vampire-esque character, a sort of Dracula-esque figure in this sort of immortal who has lived for hundreds and, you know, for him, like over a thousand years at this point and has this whole like kind of undead legacy um, and all this stuff and who values his eternal life and doesn't want to give that eternal life up. Um, it's a it's a mold we have seen in lots of other characters in like horror and fantasy fiction before. But the thing I like about Muzan is they the way that that's so kind of unflinching in depicting him as being really pathetic because I think he is really truly pathetic. Like he is super powerful. He's very hard to kill. Like he's obviously, he's a badass in that kind of sense of that, you know, it's hard for someone to actually fight him and kill him. But when you just see the life that this guy leads, it's so sad. It's like, he has nothing. He doesn't even get the like sort of thing that like the bone that your kind of vampire lord type characters usually get, which is they live like a life of like utter hedonism and that, you know, it's more of a sort of they live for these fleeting pleasures, but have lost sight of like a larger kind of joy or whatever that they love and things like that they could have in life. For Muzan, it's not even that. The only thing you get the sense of that he ever cares about at all is prolonging his life. And he never has any thought to enjoying anything of the time that he has. Like it's, you can't even imagine like Muzan being pleased, him being happy, like him being satisfied, even when a Hashiro, even like when Rengoku gets killed, he's still not happy. He's still upset. He's always mad at the demons and his children all the time because it's never enough and it will never be enough. And then when he ends up in this like confrontation, you know, if he ends up with like with the Infinity Castle thing, obviously he puts this huge spin on things that's going to prolong this confrontation tremendously. But you get the sense that if he had not set up that Infinite Castle thing, he would be completely fucked here. And that's part of the things that makes the finale so fun is that th they had him absolutely dead to rights. Like if if the rules for killing him were the same as other demons, I mean, Gyome fucking uh, destroys his entire head in like two seconds. Um, in an so it's, amazing piece of animation yes. with his big spit. Oh my god, it's so good. Yeah, his giant flail, which is the best weapon. I love that everybody else is cutting off demon heads, and he's like, no, I'm just going to smash them into a bloody fucking pulp with a giant iron yes. ball with spikes. Is very good. He goes fucking Gundam Hammer on their asses, and I'm all <laughs> here for it. You imagine me, he's the best. Um, and I just have to assume, I'm, I'm making the Gundam reference because I know that Suita in the booth is making the Gundam reference in his own head, because that dude's a massive yes. Gundam nerd. Um... But, you know, so it's like the thing I love with Muzan is that, you know, he is this just cowardly, pathetic little dude. And he never, even after this like 30 minute conversation with Ubiashti, he still doesn't fucking get it at the end of that. He has this little moment where he's like, oh, Ubiashti, I have underestimated you, you crafty, evil, cruel little fox with your black, heart, like your traps hidden in your black heart. Like, I can't believe you would kill your wife and your kids along with you. And you're just it's like, how do you still not understand that, like, he happily gave up his, his life and his wife happily gave up her life, too, 
because they know that there's something better to spend that life for. And the fact that like, he just can't fucking get it, that there's more to things than just prolonging your own existence, that that other things can have priority, that other things can be important. And he's just this, you know, sad little guy um, who thinks he's the biggest, baddest motherfucker in the world. But he's this pathetic little child who has never learned to see anything outside himself. He's like the ultimate expression of ego and how little and pitiable that kind of ego is. And it's why I love Muzan as a villain. Is I just think this series is so uncompromising in how they depict that character in that particular way and having him be this sort of very exaggerated version of those ideas, I think works great. And it gives him this very different, I think, valence than other characters in his mold and other fiction I've seen. And you just get a lot of it in this episode, and especially because you get a lot of his sort of like internal monologue after Ubiashki blows himself up. And I love that you get all that monologue and you're like, God, this dude just did not process a single word that was just said to him. And that is why he is doomed to fail is he can't learn. He can't do anything like he's just if he wasn't gifted with his magic fucking demon powers, he would be the worst dude in this whole show. He just is lucky that like, you know, lucky from a certain sense that those demon billies make him more or less invulnerable. Um, but even that, is, as I said, is like its own form of curse that he can't understand that he can't escape from. Yes, I agree with all of that. It is such a fascinating contrast from, because I agree Dracula is a figure that makes sense as a comparison, but you think of the great Dracula performances like Christopher Lee or Bela Lugosi or Gary Oldman, they got a big shit-eating grin on, they're uh-huh. happy yes. to be evil, right? Like, that's the whole thing. Um, he gets no pleasure even from the basic act of being evil. That doesn't do anything for him. You know, if he ever got, if he achieves his goal of walking in the sunlight, what the fuck's he going to do? You know, exactly. like what he would be so miserable because he'd have nothing left. He wouldn't even have a goal anymore. Right. He would be so miserable. And I feel like they would eventually kill him just because he'd slip up and, you know, he's an idiot. So there's all of that. Another comparison I want to make. I mean, you know, we have made the compare point before that, like, basically everything people like about Harry Potter, some anime does better. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is like, we could do a whole Japan Animation Station season conceptually of different <laughs> anime that do parts of Harry Potter better. That would be a really funny season to do. Um, that'd, be a, that'd be a very funny context in which to watch Little Witch Academia. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, but or, or all of Naruto for like the main trio yes. relationship or something, uh-huh. right? But anyway, um, but I've, I've actually thought a lot recently about how Kimetsu might be the clearest example because it does a lot Mm -hmm. of the main like thematic things Harry Potter does a lot more clearly. And I think Ubiashiki is one of them. He is in the exact same mold as Voldemort, which is the the theme and JK Rowling tells you it over and over again in those books because they don't have a lot of subtlety that like that is the thing is that Voldemort is scared of dying. Dumbledore is sort of like the Ubiashiki figure who gladly gives up his life because he has the faith that then, you know, Harry will take care of this, all that stuff. And, you know, I'm not going to lie and say none of that works at all. There are things I still, despite her being a piece of shit, like in, in Harry Potter. But I do think, and I was thinking this during the scene, it's a fairly similar confrontation to scenes between Dumbledore and Voldemort or Harry and Voldemort in the final books. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the fact that this is a, it's long in the context of an episode, but it's short in the overall context of the series with how few words Gotoge Sensei and with how kind of simple filmmaking choices UFO Table gets a lot of that idea through in this 20 minute stretch where I think... The Harry Potter books have to spend a lot of pages on it, and I think it's a theme the movies never... I like a lot of things in the movies more than the books. I don't know if they ever quite nail a moment that crystallizes it. And it's something that it's just... Because, again, it's, it is the nominal theme of those books, and it is something where if that's something that really moves you in Harry Potter, Kimetsu is an anime I would really recommend as, like, see see this done really, like, maturely and in a way that I think is more challenging to the viewer, too, because I think one of the problems with Harry Potter is that it 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 raises a similar level of stakes but other than kind of Dumbledore none of the main characters kind of have to put it on the line like Harry Ron or Hermione should be dead at the end of that story they're like one of them should be if that's the stakes of what it is and you're trying to show the contrast with Voldemort and I don't want to spoil how Kimetsu ends but it deals with death a lot more directly in its main cast yeah and yeah not um, everybody is getting out of this alive you know yeah, like, like we you know, can say that we character deaths in these three movies uh you know i don't think yeah. that's a spoiler to say yeah and harry potter has a lot of deaths 
But the highest profile one by the end in Harry's inner circle is probably one of the two twin brothers of his best friend. Like, that, like that's kind of the level it stops at. And I think there is something to how Kimetsu deals with this that becomes more challenging for the viewer because it it rises to the rank of people you have a really direct first person relationship with, um, and that makes it harder to stomach. And it's it's there are things in the ending of Kimetsu that have stuck with me since I read the manga that have both haunted me and uplifted me. And I think that's absolutely the goal when you're dealing with themes like this. Yeah, and that's actually that's an interesting comparison that obviously like I wouldn't think of because I never really got into the books. But having seen all the Harry Potter movies. Like it is definitely the thing that like I understood that it's th- that the what they're doing with Muzan here is what the idea for Voldemort more or less is. You know, he has like the the Horcruxes or whatever that he's put yes. his soul into and all that shit to make himself more or less immortal. Although you know, it's not like a thousand years immortal. He's lived for like a little bit extra, um, right? Like yeah. he's 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 well, like a hundred and- years old or something. It's he's he's like sixty or seventy, but also he spent a lot of that as a ghost because of the thing where he his spell backfired on Harry and all of that stuff. Um, but it also the other connection is that it's about dehumanizing. To do that, he has to dehumanize mm-hmm. himself, and he becomes demonic. That's the other thing that I think is smart. Is I I kind of think Voldemort should be like prettier in a weird way. Like uh-huh. Muzan is Muzan looks like a fucking as you say he's disgusting in how perfect he is. Whereas Voldemort is the theme that. Obviously, J.K. Rowling believes in this, that if you are ugly, you are bad. So the ugliest yeah. person must be the worst person, and that is the whole logic behind Voldemort. And Muzan twists that. Ubuyashiki is ugly, and he is beautiful in that. And Muzan is beautiful, and he is ugly in his beauty. And I think that's part of what twists this also in a way that doesn't work in Harry Potter. Yeah, because it's that thing with like watching, having watched those movies, that I understood the idea of what the Voldemort character was going for, but it always felt so vague and like diluted and partially that's because it's like sort of oddly broken up between all these different films taken that are like set over the course of seven fucking years or whatever um and it's so sort of spread out um and obviously was no not in any way shape or form the idea when the original thing was made um uh and whereas with like Kimeso Yaiba it's everything with this series partially because it's it's fairly short all things considered for the kind of series that it is it's so laser focused on these sort of central ideas. Um, and Muzan is one of those. And that's why like, I keep on coming to that word uncompromising in my head when I think of Muzan, because it's, it's what that characterization feels like to me. It feels like every single step of the way, there is no concern made at making him feel like, quote unquote, realistic or relatable in that way. Like he's a much larger than life character. He's almost like characterish in how extreme he goes, how kind of almost one note of a character he is, but that's what makes him really effective. He plays his role in the overall themes of the series so powerfully, especially because he's so different than all the demons we've met, where all the other demons we've met are, you know, they have done awful things. Um, And some of those things are maybe like, you know, not particularly easily forgiven, even when they were humans. But all of them have a humanity at their core that Kibitsuji Muzan has twisted and corrupted. Um, and it's a thing that for almost all of them, Tanjiro helps them kind of rediscover in their final moments. Um, and those demons are characters that you have empathy for because you see that they are human at their core and that humanity has been twisted. But at the end of the day, they once were people like us. And that's like part of the lesson that Tanjiro is trying to teach the other members of the Demon Slayer core. It is okay to have pity for these people because they are people. And, and I like that for Kibitsuji Muzan, that rule does not apply because this dude is a different thing. He is, he is evil. Like he is so extreme in how far his ego has taken him that you know you the final moment of this move of this TV season as you said earlier is Tanjiro falling into the Infinity Castle and you get this great little moment where he makes eyes with Kibitsuji Muzan. I also love that that Tanjiro is the only person who can recognize Muzan amongst all the yes. Hashira because he's the only one who's seen him before, which is a great little detail that he gets there. Everyone else is like, who is that? Is that him? Who is that? Um, like Gyome figures it out immediately because he was in on the whole plan. But Tanjiro shows up and he's like oh shit, that's him, that's Muzan. But then when he's falling into the castle, he looks at Muzan and he says, like, no matter what, 
you, I will not forgive you. Like no matter what, keep it Susie moves on. I'm going to kill you. And there is a there is a lack of mercy. There's a lack of sympathy. There's a lack of compassion that Tanjiro has specifically for Muzan that he does not have for literally anything else in the entire show because Muzan is so extreme of a villain. And I think that's a thing that for this series works incredibly well because it allows the larger than life themes about um, love and compassion and hatred and, and generation and life mortality and what that means that Muzan is such a perversion of all of those things that he is an existence that cannot be allowed. He is a thing that is so perverse, it can't exist in this world. And I like to have a series that is willing to have a villain that is so far that it's like, no, like there are some things that are so awful, they should not be tolerated in any way, shape or form. That is how far Muzan is on that scale. Um, and I like that it's able to draw that distinction between villains that you can have sympathy and compassion for and ones for whom this is just a thing that needs to be exercised from reality because it, it should not exist. And I like that a lot and how the series draws those distinctions. So you're saying Muzan Kibutsuji is to anime villains what Donald Trump is to American presidents? Yes. Yes, thank you for, for, for drawing the very fine point on exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> but yes, like in, in, in that, we're in like other realms, but it's like in democracy, if, if you know, and, and you know, I almost like hesitate to use the word democracy to describe the American political system. But for what we nominally call a democracy, someone who does not recognize that they lost a re an election and s said in a recent debate that he did not recognize that, should not be qualified to run again? Like, that's something that's so off the fucking register, so bad, so perverse, and so outside the system, the system shouldn't allow it to exist or in this instance to participate, right? Like, yes. and I like that, like, it feels like we sometimes allow in our fiction and then also in our real world things to sort of skate by on like weird compromises like oh well is it really that bad or it's like well, sometimes there are some things that really are actually just that bad and they have to be stopped in a way that is truly uncompromising and you don't think about like well what if like but if we did this the precedent about this like no this he should not be allowed to run keep it Suzy moves on cannot be forgiven you got to put a sword through his head like this just or or for his instance throw him out into the sun and let him burn to a fucking crisp just to anyone who wants to leave the comment of, why do they bring politics into anime? I live for this. Your comments are why I brought it up, <laughs> dicks. Anyway, um, yes, I think it's no. It's a great explanation, Sean, of why Muzan is so great. But I also think part of the brilliance of Kimetsu is having the stuff like the the you know the upper rank demons means you kind of get to have your cake and eat it too. You yes. can have your uncompromising villain in Muzan, but if you want your villains who are more charismatic and sometimes more relatable and you can sympathize with and Tanjiro will sympathize with, you get those with the others and you have those villains along the way. It's it's another thing that I think Harry Potter would have benefited from having more mini bosses under Voldemort that Harry would have taken out along the way that like are more in that vein. It's something you mm -hmm. need. Like it's, it's actually a thing that I think is a real problem in the later half of Harry Potter is that you kind of only have one villain and you have some of his like death eaters, but Harry never really has to take any of them out. None of them really get killed along the way. Like there's not a, there's not a reckoning with them. They don't bring the Malfoys over to their side. All of those issues, right? Whereas Demon Slayer gets to kind of do both. Like it has plenty of charismatic villains. Muzan is not allowed to be one of them because he yes. shouldn't. He isn't. He can't be. He is evil. He is like, if you're talking about like, what is the, what is the thing of the equivalent of like not recognizing democracy when you're in a democracy? It's that he is in the wheel of Dharma and he has neglected it. He's saying, no, I yes. am not part of reincarnation. I am not part of the cycle of life and death. And that is the thing that removes him from any consideration of empathy because anyone yeah. else, if they have the ability to die and be reborn can be redeemed. He can can't exactly yeah and it's like and all that gets into the larger spiritual themes um obviously this is all stuff that like we will talk about in lots of like depth and with other kinds of details when we get the movie trilogy um because I'm, I'm very excited to be able to get to all that stuff because there's a lot of stuff i really love about how demon slayer ends that I've, I've always seen online there's like a faction of uh people fans or not fans of the series who've read the manga that have certain opinions on how the Muzan character goes that like I just disagree with so intensely yes. and powerfully. Um, and I'm excited eventually we'll be able to do it on a, a proper podcast when we have those movies coming out. But I think like if you're someone who's read the manga 
and like is curious about our thoughts. I think like that conversation basically <laughs> says those things without the specific events of what happens at the end of the series. Absolutely. So that is season four. Let's look forward for a second, Sean. Uh, uh-huh. We both have been saying for a while, for years now, frankly, that we wanted to see Infinity Castle as a movie trilogy. They've announced that's what they're doing. How fucking excited are you? This is going to be so great. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm very excited. Like, you know, um, it's it's a thing that I'm both excited for because I think it's it's a good choice given, like, what they have to adapt. And it's also a thing that, like, I'm I'm happy for the animators at UFO Table that they don't have to try to fit that into seasons of a TV show because it's just... Man, it's just not structured that way in the manga. Like, there's no. just from a practical production point of view, I don't think there is any way to do it. Um, and so I'm very happy that they have made that choice because I think it is the right choice to to do it at the level of like production that both it deserves and that UFO Table holds itself to. And I just don't think it would have been possible on TV. And clearly, I think UFO Table felt the same way because you know they they made yes. that choice. And I think it's absolutely the right choice. I think, you know, the, this this next stretch of the manga, it is so relentless. I think having to do the work of figuring out where do you start and end episodes? You know, what parts do you have to draw out a little bit to make an episode out of this thing? You have to, you know, go into the act break. You have to end an episode, then you have to start it again. And how do you, like, I think those questions would at a certain point drag down that arc so much. And I think mm-hmm. being able to do it in the pure flow of a movie I think is is exactly the right call. I think three movies is pretty much perfect. I think from the the heaven because we also have a very recent example in the uh-huh. Heaven's Feel film trilogy. It just gives me you know full faith. I think there is still a lingering question of is this trilogy it and that's the end? Because technically the final arc is is in some cases people will split it into Infinity Castle and then this final batch of chapters. I am guessing they're doing it all in three movies. And I think if yeah. one of those movies has to be two and a half hours long to, uh, in, you know, do it, UFO Table will get to make whatever length of movie they want. They, yes. <laughs> obviously, if anyone has ever gotten that that right, again, they made the highest grossing movie in Japanese history. They can do whatever the fuck they want. And these will probably be even bigger globally because, like, the anime market has expanded in places like America. These are going to get big theatrical releases in a way that even Mugen Train four or five years ago did not. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm so I'm so excited for it. Um, yeah, because as you say, like the other thing is, it, you know, we covered it relatively recently on on Japan Animation Station is the Heaven's Feel trilogy of movies shows how good they are. I mean, it's a, it's a different kind of story, but how good they are in that of like figuring out where to like make nips and tucks and like where to begin and end to build a trilogy out of that. And I'm very curious to see what they do because I think there are there's a couple of different approaches you could make in terms of how you would organize the material into a trilogy of movies. Because as you say, because you have, obviously you have three upper rank demons left and you have Keep It Suzy Moves On. Um, and those, and there's like a lot of stuff involved in that that I'm curious to see exactly how do they structure these these films. Because I think there's a lot of different ways they could approach it. But I have a lot of faith um, that they are going yes. to find a really like fantastic way to build that out and have each movie be a really satisfying movie in its own right. While also, obviously, you know, needing to know the context of the rest of the plot, but not having it feel like it's just a part one movie or whatever, um, which they have done a very good job at up till this point with their other material. Um, even the middle Heaven's Feel movie, that is the middle part of a trilogy, is a very satisfying full movie on its own that tells its own story and its own themes. And I think they are going to be able to very much do that with Kimetsu no Yaiba, while also then bringing us to a very satisfying conclusion. Um, so I, I, I 100% agree. Yeah. I think... My very strong sense is since Mugen Train blew up the way it did, I'm guessing they've had this planned out very clearly because uh-huh. I think when you look at the Entertainment District arc, the Swordsmith Village arc, this, and and now they're going to do these movies, none of it is really how you would conventionally adapt an anime in this day and age to a certain degree. They're all weird length seasons. They they have done, you know, they've they've really you know put so much love and care into these different parts that i think you could also have seen being kind of truncated like i can imagine the version of trying to do 
what they did with for Entertainment District and Swordsmith Village in one season that kind of truncated them a little bit. But I think they've really had a goal of how they could do this when with the blank check they frankly have. And I think we're seeing a very uncompromised anime adaptation too. So I'm very excited to see how this ends. It also just, Sean, I have to say doing this, watching these again for the podcast was a pleasure because we spent a year doing all the KyoAni stuff and we loved every second of it. Even the parts that weren't as good, KyoAni is so fun to watch and they are the best at what they do. But it was nice to see UFO Table, which is also up there with KyoAni. Yes. But they're so different. And it was just nice for me a little bit to go, yeah, if, if KyoAni is number one, UFO Table is either number two or number one A, <laughs> right? Yeah. And like seeing them do their thing again, I'm just like, oh man, I'm. it was a reminder to me of like, as great as KyoAni is, anime is truly a wide and wonderful world. And, uh, and I'm just so excited to see how they end Kimetsu. I'm excited to see what they do with this off their plate because we know they have the Genshin stuff coming up. Um, we know yeah. they're working on Witch on the Holy Night. My strong suspicion, based on their uh, what they did for the Tsukihime remake, is that that might be in the works at some point. So there's all sorts of things they could do, and they're so good at it. I want to see all of it. Yes, I, but I'm also con- I'm curious when will like these movies come out? Like how long will it be? Like one movie a year? I'm you know there's there's a lot of questions still ahead. But you know, as I said, I have I have absolute faith in them. Um, that they're going to make the right choices because they've made all the right choices up to this point. And after Mugen Train, they're just like, like, what is a core of anime? What does that mean? Who gives a shit? We will shit. do what yeah. I want. I love that the first season of Kimetsu no Yaiba is the only one that fits in any way into the normal structure of like how an anime season goes and everything after that is absolutely insane. Um, you know, because you also have the whole Mugen Train TV season with like it's one extra episode at the beginning. I wonder if they're going to do that for the movies or not um, for the final movies it's there's a lot oh, of almost certainly at some point it might yeah. be way down the line but like i think they they will probably take that opportunity because it's yeah, it's frankly easy money and it also gives them the fun room to like reimagine some things yeah so there's a lot of very exciting things on the future and i'm really excited to get to those jonathan next week on weekly yaiba kimetsu Mother,